Today I'm speaking with Ken Tustin. Ken's affectionately known as New Zealand's Moose Man, as he and his wife Marg have spent many months and years searching for the elusive Fiordland Moose. Apart from that, Ken's had an incredibly interesting and varied career, ranging from studying Himalayan tar in New Zealand to helicopter flying all over the world. He's written four books, including many articles and scientific research papers. I hope you enjoy this discussion as much as I did, and if you did, please take the time to like and subscribe to the channel. It makes a huge difference. Thanks. All right, I loved reading your books, all four of them, <laughs> which I powered through in three weeks. Um, and I enjoyed finding out about your life that you had written. One thing that's pretty clear is you don't do things by halves in your life. <laughs> Everything you've done is full on. I I don't, I think if I'm going to in, in something, I don't, I want to do it well or not at all. So I give it 110%. Um, and I'm not interested in just dabbling in uh, anything that's full on or not at all. Yeah, yeah. It's very obvious and, and, and really um, interesting as well. When you write down your job or your profession, if you have to write down what you are, I'm interested to know what you put. Do you put biologist or hunter or pilot, outdoor guide, moose fanatic, author, film star? <laughs> what do you feel like you are? Um, retired. <laughs> or tired, maybe. <laughs> tired, maybe. Uh, actually, that's that's not a bad question because I, uh, I, I'm quite proud that I've done lots of things and quite different. Um, and right right now, I, I, I guess I think of the biology side as being really important to me, even... Uh, even with the other things I've done, and I've always enjoyed the history of the things I've done. And, and, and just as, as you say, um, if I get into it, anything, even if it's the flying, it's not the actual aircraft handling that was interesting. It was the places we went and the things we saw and the people we worked with um, that was more important than the vehicle which I travelled in kind of thing. Yeah, right. Um, and, I mean, the... The, the the moose project is you know on similar lines. It, the moose is the driving force, but it's fiordland and it's the landscape mm -hmm. and it's the seascape and it's the birds and it's the companionship and the challenges that go with um, you know living there long term. So mix it all up. I, I I'd I'd be struggling if someone said what do you do. Um, so I always answer. Uh, retired. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, and another thing that struck me about your life is you seem to have taken opportunities when they've arisen. If a door opens, you seem to just put your hand up and say, yep, I'll go through it. We've always thought in life you, um, you, you come across, you know, two pathways. Um, one that would be quite easy for you and you'd be quite happy doing it. And the other risky one um, is the opposite. And we've found that if you always take the risky one, you get the most satisfaction out of life. And if you don't think you can do it, you always find that you, actually you can do it. Mm. And it's like a period of growth. Um, whereas the other one would be quite comfortable, but you'd plateau. And uh, we quite like the idea uh, Maggie and I of taking the right hand turn and giving it heaps and uh, letting it play out. Even though sometimes there were some obvious challenges of being apart quite a lot, you've still sort of taken oh, those. Yeah, no, no, we just buy that off and make up for it next time we have a crack at life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, you can think of all the great experiences and the people you have met that none of that would have happened if you had taken the easy option. Uh, that's right, yeah. We'd be quite happily doing something quite um, easy and coast along. Um, but I love the adventure and the challenges of doing something a little bit different. Mm. Um, even if you don't, as I say, if you don't think you can do it, you always find out actually you can more than you thought anyway. 
you've written four books and uh, many scientific papers from what I've seen and other articles. What's your motivation for putting your experiences down in writing? I've always uh, been of the philosophy that everything I have learned I should share. Um, you know, for example, I work for the government and um, wild animal research. Now, some things lend themselves to publishing in the scientific journals, but there's a lot of material um, that isn't up to peer review standard in scientific journals, for example, which uh, have to be ex so exactly right. But the in-between times were still learning, and if anyone should follow in, in our footprints, then that's really useful information. And I like to think um, I share everything I've learned, um, even you know the, the helicopter book, which was largely you know f fun and meeting challenges and going to uh, neat places. I think of that as um, the lessons I've learned. Had I been properly mentored, someone might read that and save themselves um, an embarrassing time. Some of the upsets or, that you described. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not all of your doing. I I'm always sure. say about that book, it's quite a thick book because it lists all my mistakes. <laughs> and hopefully someone reading it might find themselves uh, um, a little better prepared. So uh, yeah, that's been the philosophy, just tell people what I've learned. Um, otherwise, that information disappears forever. Mm. And I'd like to talk about some of those mistakes later on when we talk about your helicopter flying, because like you say, people can learn from them, but if nothing else, they're bloody interesting. Oh, <laughs> and you're still here to tell yeah, the stories. That, yeah, that, that's right. Um, I always, uh, with my flying, for example, I always put my acts of the day under my own microscope and, and said, how can I have done this better? Um, and as you mature into the job, you, you make less and less mistakes. But my goodness, there's still a lot to learn. Yeah. And another thing that I really enjoyed about your books that I think um, gave a lot of credibility, especially to the tar and the moose stories, is the fact that you are a scientist and you include a, a lot of the scientific detail um, in a manner that can be understood by the layman and it's all mixed up with your personal stories. So it, you're seeing both sides of it. It's not just a whole collection of stories, but you're seeing, well, there was research, long, tedious research done and it's all documented and that adds a lot of credibility in my mind. Oh, no, thank, uh, thank you for that, Craig. I, when I wrote the helicopter book, I, I thought I haven't actually read a book written by the pilot. You know, you see... Um, uh, accounts in the paper of, say, a, a rescue or thing, and a helicopter pulled a climber off Mount Aspiring, or a helicopter, you know, rescued someone in a tricky situation. But, you know, someone sat in the left hand seat and someone sweated it on the way in, mm. and was grateful on the way out if he could pull it off. Um, the same with the science thing. I wasn't just interested in recording the results, I was quite keen that people know what how questions were asked of us about particular animals or situations and how we went about finding out mm -hmm. and you know the hot and the cold of it all and and the work in doing that I thought that was all part of the story and, and it hadn't in my view it had been told very well before and so all I could do was write what happened to me and I um, hope that some people might find it interesting. Mm -hmm. So let's start off with um, the Himalayan tar story. <laughs> and I mentioned to you um, last night that the New Zealand Mountain Monarchs book, which covers your story of studying Himalayan tar in New Zealand, um, was one of the best books I've ever read. <laughs> and it was so, such a nice surprise because, to be honest, I was expecting a, a fairly dull scientific um, assessment of the study of tar in New Zealand. But um, what I actually got was a whole collection of your stories about studying them in very personal accounts. Um, so I, it had me gripped right through, and at the end I, I realised that I'd learned a hell of a lot about these animals as well. So it was a really nice surprise. Um, what is it about tar or Himalayan tar that you find so interesting and captivating and, and beautiful? 
because clearly you do admire them as an animal. They're not a pest in your mind. Yeah. Well, I've got great respect for the tar. And I remember in my university years, um, I spent two summers as a hunter uh, 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 for tar. Uh, I was hunting for research rather than deer culling. So it also it felt like anything that we learned from that effort was contributing to what we know about the animal. It wasn't just a, a tally of a, of a pest. Um, I mean, you think of a 19 and 20 year old kid give, being given a big chunk of the Southern Alps uh, and, and sent off in November and collected at the end of February. I mean, what a gift. What a gift for a young, keen <laughs> lad um, to be presented with an opportunity in that landscape to do something useful um, with wild animals that had been previously just thought, you know, knock one off and take it off as another kill. So it was adding something um, uh, to what we know about the animal, even though the project, of course, wasn't my own. Um, but it was close proximity to you know the landscape and the animal and how it worked. And I just that that made me really want to get into wild animal research because I loved the mountains and I was familiar with them and I loved you know, working with an animal that I respected. Um, and I mean, I got that chance, which I'm really grateful for. Um, Tower and, and, and the Himalayas are a near endangered species. Um, so Tower in Nepal are also di very difficult to research. So we had the opportunity to, to here to learn about that animal uh, and how it was affecting our landscape. And it, the behaviour side, which I specialised in and delighted in, hadn't really been uh, researched pretty well by anyone else much before. Aspects of it had. Um, so it was a, it felt a real privilege to be given the, the chance to, you know, to, to add. And there's a big picture now, too. We're not just talking about tar and their effect on landscape and how they work in New Zealand. You're talking about a wild animal to the science community, which no one knew a heck of a lot of about. And you're talking about how animals um, behave, which other studies can compare with the ones that they've researched. And you're talking about how uh, animal populations um, manage themselves, um, you know, the social structures and all the things which play off into lots and lots of not only other animals, but all as aspects of our lives uh, as well, um, social organisation things. So I found that absolutely fascinating. I couldn't do it all when I worked for Forest Service, but I, I picked it up again at, after I finished flying and, and, and did it privately. Now, that material wasn't suitable really for um, a scientific publication that wasn't up to standard. Um, but it would certainly, written down, be a great help to anybody that was doing it better or more professionally than I could. Mm. It seems like um, that second go at it that you mentioned was a, a more on emotional level, isn't quite the right word, yeah. but it was more for your own enjoyment and study of their manner, mannerisms and behaviours. Would that be right? Uh, yes, uh, that that's true. Um, the, the observation project I had was, let, was how they use the landscape and how that changes with season. And of course, I was dealing just with one, uh, one small group, 25 to 30 tar on a single bluff, um, a female juvenile uh, collection of animals. And of course, they weren't visited uh, they were visited only by mature males during the rut. And that gave me a lot of questions to ask about how can I uh, look at, at a bigger picture of it. And I was fascinated with the social behaviour and the hierarchies and particularly um, the, the um, social displays of you know dominance in, in animals and how that kind of played out because mm. that that was social organisation at its, um, you know, being displayed at its best, which only happens in the rut. So that was the the part that I took up 
you know, after my research, formal research life as a, as a private citizen and, yeah. and just wanted to, to learn more about that. Mm. Can we go back just a step? Um, so for those watching this that aren't familiar with the story of tar in New Zealand, um, it's a long story and there's a lot of controversy over recent times about how they're managed, which um, I think we need to talk about. But could you just give a very brief introduction about how they came to New Zealand, um, how they came to be here, and maybe a brief story up until 1993 when the management plan came in, into place? Um, basically, it was the fashion of the times in the late 18. 18- and up to about 1920 to f- for New Zealand to be a kind of a sportsman's paradise. And it was seen by the government, um, it was a government exercise. Um, our mountain lands and forests were considered a bit of a blank slate for sportsmen. And you could bring the scene to life if you introduced sporting animals, which would benefit the colony because the fashion in those days was uh, overseas sportsmen um, coming uh, to New Zealand, you know, for the fish and the game and the game animals and game birds, um, as you know, as part of a worldwide circuit. And it was a it was a financial thing. It wasn't for New Zealand sportsmen, um, really. So Tower were introduced in 1904 um, from a game park in England, the Woburn Abbey. Um, and released in, uh, around Mount Cook, and over the years um, spread like pebble in a pool, you know, um, um, along the eastern side of the Alps and through onto the west, um, gradually and steadily to utilise the habitat which they enjoyed most, which was the bluff systems and the high mountain um, herd fields and grasslands. And like all all the other ungulates that were introduced, um, they're into super abundant food. And of course, the populations expanded to the limits of their food. And um, uh, and in doing so, you know, the, the habitat was affected. Um, so vegetation wise, people started looking with great concern about the changes that were wrought by animal populations as they grew and spread. How long after the introduction was the concern starting to be raised? Uh, 1930s, <coughs> early 1930s was when the microscope went on uh, to, the f- to the point where all protection was removed around about 1930-34 um, from wild game animals and they s- ceased to be managed as they had been by the local acclimatisation societies. It was almost a a competition on those days between the various regional uh, acclimatisation societies for their region to have the best, the biggest and the most most diverse um, game animals, birds and fish, Mm -hmm. um, which fitted the the sportsman um, aspect sportsman slant on it that the government was giving. And the thought of what they might potentially do to the landscape and the local wildlife was obviously never given us. It it was given very little thought um, initially and then as things got uh, more pressured or more obvious you know some of of the senior botanists and things stood up and complained which made the government take a different look at things. And as a result of that, um, government control campaigns started um, with the beginning of the deer colours, for example, mm. uh, which were uh, the, the whole thing was to limit population numbers. Um, and uh, you know, the, people became progressively more anxious when they looked at, at what the animals were doing to landscape and how they were displacing um um, some of the native species. That was quite late, though. I mean, the the initial problems with deer and tar um, were, were displacing stock, you know, oh, okay. from um, mountain lands, and that yeah. that wasn't on really. Yeah. 
So in the late 60s, when the whole venison culling program came into place, the tar numbers also took a massive um, um, dive, especially when helicopters came in. Yeah, when helicopter hunting started, um, it was really a force that hadn't been reckoned with and was treated initially by the government agencies uh, concerned with controlling animal numbers with a little bit of amusement. And then they found how deadly and effective they were, and it was actually, um, you know, putting public servants out of their jobs, which they had taken uh, decades and decades to build quite an empire. So there was a, a, a bit of amusement, but I mean, a, a handful of cavalier individuals in their helicopters very quickly made huge inroads into deer populations that that formerly we, you know, were unable to do anything much with, despite all the, the efforts by deer colours, um, you know, to do that very thing. So um, that followed later with tar because of the, they lived in such fierce country, um, steep and snowbound, and um, if you shoot one, how on earth can you pack it up? But in the winters of 1971, 72, 73, 74, 75 in particular, helicopters were running out of deer, and you had very skilled operators, only a handful of them really, made huge inroads into tar populations. I think they went from about 30,000 to less than 2,000 in about five or six winters. Mm -hmm. um, and they were exported for their meat? Yeah, they were exported along with the deer for their meat. I believe that the tar went over, especially Pacific Islands, uh, classed as goat yep. or, or something. But there's a really market for them. Uh, and the uh, you know the numbers that went over for, were enormous, um, and the populations changed really dramatically, and uh, culling the, the government culling of tower was really difficult because you have to be a mountaineer mm. as well as a as a as well as a hunter, and you're subjected to all things that mountain do to you, like get rained on and snowed <laughs> on. <laughs> uh, so it was pretty dangerous. Mm. So in the mid '60s, uh, was it that you landed what seemed like a dream job with working with Graham Corley? Yes, that was my student days. Yes. Yeah. So that was mixing hunting with wild animal ecology. Yes. Do you want to describe what that? And it was a research. Graham had a research project. Great. Do you want to describe what the research project yeah. was trying to achieve and where okay. you fit, fitted into it? Right. Um, Graham was way before his time, and he was a um, ecologist and biomathematician, if you like. He wanted to t to take uh, wild animal populations in in different states um, and describe them mathematically, um, so that um, describe the state of a population in mathematical terms uh, in order to bring that, uh, something that would carry on and and be useful in all wild animal uh, understanding of wild animal populations everywhere. He's a population ecologist, right? Um, you know, in the days when no one could even spell ecology. So mm. <laughs> you, you have to realise too that um, in a um, in a wild animal population, it was very very difficult or nearly impossible socially anywhere in the world to get a sample of wild animals for autopsy and inspection um, simply wasn't permissible in mm. terms of you know how people looked at wildlife in New Zealand we could do that and so I think in his first season we, sh we shot the boys shot the godly and got I don't know, 11 or 1200 animals we shot um, the uh, increasing population fringe areas and I think we needed about four to six hundred animals to give them a decent sized sample. So, so by sample, sample is what, what were you you were autopsying them and and oh, we shot all studying we, what? Yeah, we shot all we could in females only because that you get reproductive information off females and off males. Um, as many as we could and autopsied, give a brief autopsy on each one, which sort of said you know um, sex, age, size reproductive state, um, a, f a few other uh, condition measurements and so on. Mm. And of course, when you compare all three, 
states it's telling you quite a bit about uh, invading populations um, uh, you know the physiological responses that 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 that, that animals have in in those three states mm. yeah that's the kind of thing i haven't articulated that very well but you and probably I, get the gist yeah and i guess you need a, a, a certain mass of data to give credibility yeah, to the quant- data. yeah you're dealing with with, with maths you need a, um num- you need numbers mm. and and quite big numbers and you think of a population state um there's a, there's a lot of animals in the younger age classes and you get fewer and fewer and fewer by the time you get to age 10 plus you're only dealing with a handful even though your sample might be four or five hundred animals mm-hmm. that's the kind of thing so it all sounds quite easy um you know out hunting and shooting tar but this landscape that you're working on is vertical it was really challenging <laughs> do you um, want to um <laughs> maybe just mention a little bit about the dangers and how, how you found it initially and did you have any um you know near-death experiences <laughs> oh, yeah. um <laughs> pretty hard to, ge- to generalize but uh, yeah it is a challenging landscape i mean you're talking southern alps you're talking snowfall you're, you're talking River crossings were, were always, um, could be really horrific, a real danger. We, um, ice, snow, um, you know, we took, we took one, uh, one season an injured, um, mate out on the back of a pack horse kind of thing for a, a slipping on, a slip on ice. Um, weather, yeah. Uh, was it a teach yourself sort of program? It kind of was, really. I, I worked with um, it was f- four of us in a, a in a team, and um, in our team, the year I started, we had uh, two guys that had worked on the Godly the season before, so they kind of mentored us. Mm-hmm. And in the third season, we mentored mentored yeah. people, and it's just bushcraft. Um, kind of near mountaineering skills required mm. um you've still got to shoot and recovering animals of course was was really difficult sometimes they would drop into places where you, you couldn't get or you could only get the next day with a rope kind oh, of thing yeah. so uh that was some, some pretty fearsome stuff mm. well we of course you know young and fit and keen and smart and um and not scared of heights not uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not professing uh not confessing to it um and, and helping one another the comradeship on those things always shot in pairs with tar mm. were there mm. any guys that turned up for the job and just couldn't do it yes many many and you could pick them straight away mm. i keep running into these people we did this with and i keep hearing as they say like me hey best days of my life best days of my life it was just fabulous you know kids in the mountains with months ahead uh and highly competitive amongst ourselves um um thrilling um dealing with an animal which not much was known about hardly anything written about uh, uh yeah feeling of privilege another man that seems to have had a great influence on your life maybe your later um study of tar was george sheller uh uh-uh. i said that correctly yes Schaller. um and just repeating what you said about him but <clears throat> i found it really interesting so he taught you how to watch animals and learn their social behavior um splitting up their activities into maintenance courtship or threat um, you learnt their gestures. So you said, under the tutelage of the Supreme Master, the result was like opening the door of a windowless hut on a frosty morning. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Sunlight just flooded in, George, George explained. I sat transfixed, fascinated by this dawning new world being so patiently explained. Had you... I said that, but I said it, and it was so... I haven't heard it said read to me before but it's so exactly how it was mm. Corley was populations numbers um states how you break down you know fecundities and life tables and all sorts of other things but george shaller 
was uh, looking at more at the individuals and how they made up the society of, of the animals and how those um, hierarchies played out and the the subtlety of the the uh, wild animal displays, uh, you know, with posture and with um, erection of body hair and mm. with um, <clears throat> uh, competition between males to see who did the mating, that kind of thing. And I just love that. And, and and I picked that up later in life, something I couldn't do at North Branch with my range use study, which, but I follow that up you know, when I'd finished my flying and all that in, in a private study and just carried that on an extra arm's length, if you like, for myself to make sure I understood it. And um, in, in the bigger picture, um, that fits with all wild animals, how tar um, societies work and uh, and how animals, wild animals organise themselves. And it's it's more than tar again. It's everything. It's even humans. I mean, and you, you had know, you you you've related it to humans. I in, yeah. in quite a, um, I think what you said when you're talking about animal hierarchies versus humans, there's one glorious difference between the two. Animal hierarchies are free from cultural and religious overtones. Exactly. <laughs> Imagine if we didn't have to bother with that. Exactly. What an honest world it would be. It, well, it, it is. And it was, that was something so gorgeous about working with wild animals and working with tar in particular, um, that, that that those subtleties were were displayed. And, and I think of there's no animal I can think of more than a Himalayan tar that that has so many visual um, effects that it can bring in, into uh, play when it's communicating or or, or perhaps um, being challenged, you know, by another. Mm. Uh, you know, the um, a male is you know twice three times as big as a female. Already, that says something about competition because that's evolved to be useful. Maybe. Because they were an alpine animal, and fighting was so dangerous, everything went visual. Yeah. So, you know, a male in, is capable of erecting his mane, but not only um, erecting generally, erecting it differentially. You know, he can play off the front. He can erect the dorsal ridge, and fully blown up one looks like a grizzly bear. They it's do. Amazing. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, yeah, but not only that, he. Ha he then has a problem if if he's confronted with um, another male of similar size, a real contest um, uh, of who's the biggest and who's therefore who's going to do the mating takes place. And so you have um, senior male to senior male encounters with every effect that they have without actually uh, in, uh, engaging in combat. Um, um, w with posture, pace, male, body placement. Now, when he's courting a female, he's got to um, take away those fearsome effects, and he does so in, in quite a different way. He places his body face on rather than side on, which is the, you know, the smaller um, profile. With his head very low. Yeah. I learnt about all this. Yeah, he'll. Um, <laughs> Toss his head back so, you know, his weapons, the horns are buried in a little bit of cape that he can um, erect over his head. He's chin up and that's the sort of thing. And it's a visual language yeah. and it's displayed so beautifully in tar and it's harder to find even though it exists in, in other animals. The tar, it's open box stuff. And I, I just love that because um, this visual language taking place in an encounter that's got to have an outcome um, y you know you can read it um, and I, lo I loved it that's I guess what drew me back to to doing the things I couldn't do at North Branch because um, I was more into the social work and that was inspired by George Scheller's uh, uh, tutelage and before you learnt all this from George were you pretty much like any other hunter you would see 
three or four tar on a face, there's four animals, shoot their dead and not really have any knowledge of um, their behaviour patterns or stages of life. I, I like to think when we engaged with them professionally in those early days, we took much more of an interest in it than just targets because remember we were already shooting for science. So we were, and we were looking, you know, and McCauley got me to um, write a report at the end of the season of, uh, and of course I was always conscious of, uh, of being aware I wanted to work with tar um, when I when I grew up, I feel like when I'd finished my degrees and, and came back because I was so fascinated with the animal and I so little known about them. So I was never um, um, a, a hunter just for numbers. I was a hunter for information right from the very start, I right. think. Yeah. In uh, between 76 to 78, you carried out that really interesting solo study that you yep. referred to briefly yep. um, in the north branch of the Godly. Do you want to um, just tell us a bit about that? It, it was pretty intense, oh. very cold, really <laughs> interesting. It was. It was. Uh, I, I could see there was a big gap um, between um, what we needed to know about tar is just how they used landscape, how they used the food that was available, how that was affected by season, um, how loyal they were to their particular block, and so on, and so on, and so on. And that could only be done with a long-range observation study. And um, I pushed fairly hard to be able to do it because the uh, Forest Service was, wasn't particularly interested in, in that kind of thing. They were more keen on their, just on their control uh, and dealing with numbers. But I could see that if we were to manage tar intelligently in years to come, it was always going to be how much do we know about the animal and, and, it, and its effects and behaviourally um, what to expect. You can't go in with a blank slate if you don't know how to count them, you don't know what, what they eat, you don't know this and that. And... Um, it seemed to me if I was permitted to do an, a, um, at least a two-year observation study, we'd answer lots and lots of questions, which would be important later on when we took a wider angle view of TAR. And eventually, you know, I was um, given the opportunity to do so. It took a fair bit of time and work in the bush, in the mountains, to get a place that, that worked. I found one on North Branch in the, in the Godly. And it was, I, I was able to sight a little hut, I mean, just a couple of paces by a couple of paces with a roof on. Um, which was flowing up there? Which was flowing up there, there by, by helicopter. I, I, I cut a little place for it on, uh, at a site about 4,000 feet. And it, it looked directly opposite to a big bluff system mm. that went up to 7,000 um, you know, was absolutely typical of Canterbury um, bluff systems, prime habitat for tar. And on my bluff system, I had about 25 to 30 um, tar that lived there, female juveniles, which lived separately than the males. Um, I had to work out how to mark some of them, at least, so that I was knew I was dealing with the same animals. Uh, and we did that with a collar snare system. So you had to climb up to the bluff system oh, oh, on the yeah, opposite yeah. face and set up the snares. Oh, yeah, yeah, we set up snares, and they were self-attaching if you if you got it right. Um, and it, for example, interface between a bluff and a scrubland was often a, a little uh, animal trail, and and we could set a snare up there. An uh, animal would run through it, go around its neck. Uh, it would um, engage, click around. Uh, through a smart little um, system <laughs> and break off at a weak point and you end up with the animal with a coloured collar. Right, okay. okay. And it didn't. It often didn't work, mostly didn't work. Um, and you had to be careful that the snare wasn't so big um, it was, or so, so small that, you know, an animal couldn't grow into it over the yeah. years. And, and, and so the younger animals 
the snare was very loose fitting if, if we got it so they lost some of that but anyway i was able to mark enough to know that i was dealing with the, with the same animals and with tar since they're social animals if you mark have one marked you've got the group marked really for, for your observations that followed um yeah so i spent my uh two years two and a half years uh working out of that little hut at four thousand feet describing the actions of the tar on the face opposite um so when you say describing the actions i had can oh, you describe the describing? Oh, I describe <laughs> the describing. How are you documenting it, it, it? It had to be uh, because it's science. It had, and we're trying to quantify, you know, the flowing movements of animals which sit and eat and stand and groom and feed and run away and come back again. It had to be um, very, very disciplined. So I just, I, I drew up um, kind of the things I needed to know. One was activity. Okay, how. What it, what a tar doing during the day, so I had five minute counts um, where I scan a group and describe what every member was doing or categorise it. You know, sitting, resting, grooming, feeding, moving. Every five minutes. Every five minutes. Yeah. Um, and you went. You know, when the second hand hit the twelve, I'd work my, through the group I was watching, left to right, brr, jot, 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 and. I've, we do that um, for about four days oh. in a row, um, and the other one was a sort of disposition. How all the tar on that bluff were every hour um, of of the next four days, if you like. Um, so you know where they rested, where they fed, every hour how that how that had changed, so that. I could kind of quantify it because, um, you know, I had sheets of paper drawn up or circled. I knew all the vegetation communities on the bluff. I drew them on a on a on a, um, on a sheet. Um, I had plastic overlays, for example, that fitted on the sheet, and afterwards I could say what every tower was doing okay. every hour. Um, what type of vegetation was using it and the activities would say whether it was just sitting out or it was feeding in it <laughs> kind of thing so it was uh it, you know when you're looking when you're saying observation study you're not just gawking through a Panera, pair of binoculars saying oh fancy that yeah yeah there's a very disciplined way of recording um everything they do in a way that, that lends itself to a bit of analysis at the end and so i did that um see it had to span at least two seasons so that you knew um wasn't one off because then then you see animal patterns um animal use patterns um so that that was kind of what i did and then there was a social behavior aspect of it which i picked up later on as we've just discussed but it, enough to know what I was getting into because it was a female and juvenile group you know there was only young males up to two and a half years old before they wandered off uh, to join male only groups um, in groups. summer yeah but of course during the rut um, the males would drift in, and into my block and caught my females and get displaced by bigger males and so on so I got a a very nice look at how things worked, but but not enough quantity to be able to write anything about what happens, you know, bigger picture in the in the rut. But some nice hints of it. Mm. So the social behaviour stuff was something I wanted to develop, but couldn't quite there because I wasn't subjected to males all year round. Um, but I did follow that up. Um, and then, of course, there's a, the, the seasonal influence with snow and um, um, well, and spring and spring flushes and what grows at what times of the season. It was kind of my. I was on one side of the valley and the tower on the other, and the tower very sensibly took the sunny face, and I was in the shady face. Um, so I lost the sun in May, didn't get it till September. 
So while the Tao were rejoicing under um, um, warm sunshine, I was, my butt was freezing off wow. in the blue, cold, snowflake, scrubby face next door in my little hut. Um, I used to go uh, about 10 days a month generally. but Year if, round. Year round, yeah. 10 to 12 days in a row but if stuff was happening like the rap or the seasonal births i'd go for longer i think um the rap one rap i spent 21 days up there um i can remember that the temperature never went above minus four and up to minus eight so it was like living in a deep freeze how did you uh, stay warm <laughs> how did i you stay didn't. warm <laughs> how did i stay warm my goodness it, it was a problem because in order to view, uh, this little hut had a window that opened. It's a little bit like a caravan, really. It had a window that opened um, upwards, and I could mount my paired spotting scopes on the window sill, and I had a little um, bench which I could rest my elbows on, and I had a little tape recorder if I wanted to. Movement was something was happening too fast to record or didn't lend itself to what I was trying to do. I could yak away into the spinning tape. Um, uh, and I, you know, I had to be really very careful. Uh, oh, oh, that's what I was going to say. The temperature inside the hut had to be the same as the temperature outside. Otherwise, oh. the heat shimmer effect meant I couldn't I'd, you know, lose my tar. So you couldn't light a fire. And so I could, no, there was no way. I had a wee gas heater in there, which I could use once I clammed up for the for the night but but in the yeah you know, just everything had to be the same temperature or i couldn't see so it was very very cold um and of course in winter um, or during the rut when it's frosty that was when you know some of the most um exciting action uh took place but so um yeah so no i i <laughs> was Great with great joy, I was doing something I really wanted to do. The uh, life of an animal isn't, uh, you know, a heck of a lot of it's, it's resting or it's sitting down or it's standing up or it's licking itself. Um, isn't very exciting, but you have to record the dull and the tedious with with exactly the same precision as you do the exciting stuff that happens. So, so I guess there's a huge amount of high boredom and monotony for you. Uh, yeah, you just have to overlook that because of of the purposefulness of your game. Um, the other thing in winter, if you're, you've got 17 hours of of darkness. Mm. Um, and I used to divide the night in, in half, really, because at the end of an observation period, you know, you shut the windows, um, put the gas heater on, but, you know, it's still only sort of five in the afternoon. <laughs> uh, you still had to get through till uh, seven o'clock the next morning. Um, so I used to divide. And, and you'd you'd end up being quite tired from the intensity of concentration through these um, binoculars. So I'd write up what I'd learned in summary, um, put the heater on, cook myself a meal on the little gas stove I had, um, go to bed. I wake up at 11 o'clock, um, read my books. Um, at that stage, I was also doing a um, commercial pilot's license by correspondence. So uh, I'd study my flying or navigation or <laughs> weather or whatever it was. Minus eight degrees. Yeah, at, at, uh, by, by that stage, the, in, the interior of the hut was a little bit warmer. Um, I know that because the condensation on the roof, um, which, which had frozen into stalactites, would start dripping and, and form stalagmites on the floors. So yeah, you had to be pretty careful where you stepped. And then uh, about what, three o'clock at night, I'd go to bed again and then wake up at daylight and uh, do it all again. In summer, it was the opposite. In summer, we had long, long days, and that became pretty tiresome. I think it was about 17 hours of daylight so oh, which you're watching the end oh yeah all daylight. of doing that same disciplined um stuff so uh and the heat shimmer and all sorts of things made it yeah quite quite testing did and you miss 
much um, information that you couldn't see in the hours of darkness? That think? was one weakness of this study because you try to carry on their activity, especially in summer, um, beyond where you can see them. Uh, but you can see them at the last light and you can pick them up at first light, but there's stuff happening in between. Um, oh, we, we played a little bit with night vision gear, but uh, it didn't really work for me because the distances were were too great and uh, the night vision gear was pretty crude and all you got was a sort of a light spot I didn't, weren't able, wasn't really able to tell if, what it was doing so that yeah that was a weakness and there was no way of really addressing it but you could get some idea from um, where the animals finished up and where you know in the late evening and where they started off in the morning how much movement had taken place yeah what happened to the data? Did you find out that what they um, were doing all day was just random or there was a structure to it which it was, was unexpected? No, no, it was nothing. Uh, there was a real, um, there was nothing random at all. It was very much a choreographed thing that played off exactly the same in the next season. That is, at what altitude they rested. When you pick them up, in the middle of the day, say, they're resting at various altitudes depending on the season, okay? Um, and the 25 might be in one, two, or three groups, sometimes smaller or sometimes larger. Um, about four o'clock in the afternoon, they would spring to life and um, within a, an hour or two would drop to the altitude where they, where they fed and they'd stay there until first thing the next morning and then they'd climb back to rest again. But the altitude they rested and what they fed on depended on the season and it depended on to, um, you know, the snow line and um, the snow depth and uh, what in spring and autumn, what particular plant communities were flushing and that that kind of thing. And the, the patterns year, year to year were... Very, very similar. Very similar. Well, the thing is with Tar, and this is quite an interesting thing that people kind of forget, that most wild animals retreat um, during winter to a place where it's easier to live. The well, Tar stay exactly where they were, are, or even climb an altitude and live on the steeper country where snow can't accumulate. So they actually inhabit that small piece of terrain all year round. Um, and the other interesting thing was how my little group of 25 to 30 animals um, remained on that site uh, specifically, you know, the whole year. They, there was better food around on the front faces, but they never went. Um, there was better food uh, on my side of the valley than it was on their side. They stayed loyal to that side the whole time, and I knew that because dealing with animals that I knew, I had names for them, kind of thing. You know. And presumably, if but, they're there all year round, they would be there their whole lifetime. Oh, that, well, that's right. Yeah. So you, you think now, what, you know, which animals move out? You know, and, and at what age do they move out? Um, and so those are the sort of questions you are asking as you went along. It's often. Um, harder to ask a good question than it is to find an answer yeah. you know but but those, those are the sort of things i was trying to address so uh yeah in, in my little block um those animals were loyal to that system for their whole life um yeah yeah something you said about research is um research is like a long walk to a distant destination on the way, the falls and sprints are memorable, but mostly it's one long trudge. And final arrival, while always looking closer, is never quite achieved. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly how it, uh, that's exactly how uh, wild animal research is. So you don't and quite get the answers you, you never, want at the never end. Never quite. You never quite complete anything, yeah. but you're uh, along the way. You're always adding to adding to it little uh, small increments. Mm.
one really lovely thing you mentioned was the birth of the the kid. Ah, yeah. Not a not an adult kid, a, a yeah. tar kid. Um, and again, you said there was such a gentle intimacy about the event that even watching it from afar felt intrusive. Oh, yeah, it's really moving stuff. Mm. You know, the just the details how an animal, wild animal reacts. This is what was lovely about the tower because you could see every, the way I'd placed the hut and the face opposite, there was very little time where an animal was so completely concealed I couldn't see what it was doing. Um, so uh, I did have an inside view and, you know, the intimacy of those sorts of occasions, how, you know, a female separates itself from its mates and then what happens to, to the kid at what age it does this and that and when yeah, does it start the whole playing. Story, and yeah. We, yeah, yeah. So that's a chunk of social behaviour that came, you know, as an add-on to to this, you know, maybe the, the serious stuff was the range use and the food use and all that. But that, um, those sorts of things, events, got me thinking more about the social lives of, of wild animals and how they can be explained and what what a privilege it is, you know, to see them totally at rest, totally being ignored by, uh, you know, not confounded by being disturbed, um, <clears throat> living a life of, on their own. Um, another interesting comment you made was about loneliness during that time because you spent long periods by yourself. Oh, yeah. And, um, loneliness was when something profoundly moving happened and there was no one to turn to, to share it with. After watching the birth of that little kid, I felt truly lonely. <laughs> That's yeah. an interesting way of describing yeah. loneliness. Yeah, no, no, it, it, it's so true. And it's the same with... Um, Say going into moose country uh, later in later years um, on a solo, you know, it might be a month solo, and something magical happens, and there's just you, and you think, oh, blow! I wish Marg was here; she yeah. would have loved to have seen that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but but that's true. The other time was I've, I felt lonely, um, really lonely up there. It was you know I was. I was a visitor, I hardly ever visited in my little hut. It wasn't a very good place to visit. But one time, two of the old um, crew from the Cawleys days found me, climbed up the face, not, you know, <laughs> gave a big yahoo, <laughs> and came and we sat and relived life for a couple of hours, staring out at the hill, which was actually being um, uh, covered in mist and fog and drizzle that day. I used to only get little glimpses of the animals, it wasn't much of a day. And then knock, knock on the door, and here, here comes two of the old mates from the old days, and we had a cup of tea and ate a great big bit of fruit cake that one of them had bought, and then they left. And then the cloud closed in, and then it was just me, having been recently visited, first time ever, <laughs> in the deathly silence. And, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, another time you think, my goodness, I'm not, what am I doing here? <laughs> I'm a small piece in this yeah, huge land. Yeah, just a wee speck on, on a mountainside. Mm. When you um, say people come and visit, and the same as you getting there each time, you're, you're climbing 4,000 feet up the hill. Yeah, obviously. yeah, I've got I've got a fair climb to be mid, mid-slope from the you know raggedy old valley bottom. Mm. And that was pretty difficult sometimes in winter with um, snow and, and slippery and ice. Or if you're carrying a big load, I carried a gas bottle up there once, which took a while. But, um, yeah, you just you wear that. Um, and then later on in life, you made a video with Steve Cooper um, documenting a lot of the tar mannerisms and gestures that you, you had yep. learned early on called Mountain Monarchs. Yep. It was really interesting, especially after reading the book, you know, yep. what, what I'd sort of learned. Well, here it is in, in yep. actual fact. Was that challenging to make and get close enough to video that without them knowing you're there? I, I started off with that just wanting to clarify for myself the things that we'd been talking about with George Scheller um, to get a really... Um, good view of um, 
the uh, the, the courtship and uh, antagonism, agonistic behavior, and, and and hierarchy in Tao and how it was achieved, and the subtlety of some of these um, um, dis, uh, visual displays that they do to get to know it time and time and time again in such detail that it was be able to dis, describe it. And of course, you're dealing with flowing motions, so uh, you know it's pretty hard to quantify or anything even even to write about so I took a, a little, tiny um, video I got myself a little video camera and I used to climb to 6,000 feet or so each day staying at a, um, a little must a, a little station hut um, I, I'd climb each day to 6,000 feet and make myself as small as possible and sit behind a rock or a tussock uh, with a group of tar in view and to see it, let the whole day play out. And um, in the rut, you know, there was um, males coming and going and displacing one another and all that, and I was filming it but in, in total so that when I looked at it again or played it through or... Uh, understood it on the spot what what was happening mm. um it was so exciting well often wasn't exciting actually sometimes it was bloody tedious but when things went your way it was so exciting um that um i could see you know you, you could make a film out of it which would be really compelling and it might make people look at at Tara in a different way, mm. not as a target or something to stick on the wall, but as an animal which is telling us all sorts of things about, uh, you know, animal organisation and how they, um, how, how they ran their lives and who was boss and, you know, the advantages of being boss and what happened to the victor and the vanquished. Um, and, and so t t to let this play out, Steve made himself known to me and his skill as a cameraman and his equipment and all that just we took it to a to another level to make it um to make a story out of it you know just for those reasons yeah the strategy here is uh, to climb and it's usually a, an hour to a couple of hours in that and i try and position myself about um, 400 meters from a group of tar if I can find them and I'll set the camera up and then I'll just sit there all day and um, sometimes things go with you and sometimes they don't about one day in five I get some really nice working footage um, and about one day in twenty something absolutely magical happens and I find myself in a group that is working around towards me them being entirely natural and that is a, a real thrill uh. And uh, so we worked with with him. He'd come up. I'd, I'd be doing. I'd usually go up for two or three weeks or months, and Steve might come up for a week. And by then, I knew, um, you know, where the animals were and who was in charge, and and so on. And we'd work together. And with his better kit, he was able to, um, you know, do some really smart filming. And with me being up there you know, for a month, time and time again, year after year, I had some special, really special clips as well. So we combined what we'd, um, what we'd found into a, um, a little piece that we hoped would make people understand tar more. Uh, you know, a hunter, um, and, and hats off to them, will go up, um, he'll do a similar climb, you know, he'll find some animals through his binoculars, He'll stalk them, he'll lie across a tussock, he'll line them up with his rifle, he'll catch his breath, squeeze the trigger, boom, shoot the biggest one. That's his day finished. I'd do exactly the same thing, except I'd squeeze the wee trigger on my video camera and my day was just starting. Mm. And I loved, the, I loved it when... Um, when I was nicely in place and, you know, in the evening, late afternoon especially, 
you know, stuff happened and the tar worked towards me. Sometimes I was totally surrounded by them, only a few feet away, wow. being absolutely dead still. And they were totally ignoring me, were, were, were carrying out, you know, all the stuff that I'd seen distantly for ages. And there it was, you know, the sound, the noise, um, the, uh, the displays in every small um, aspect you know, visible and Which obvious. Which you now and, understood exactly what's yeah, going on. Yeah, and, and I had a fair handle on it by yeah. then, and yeah. it was just, um, as I say, playing out at short range in front of me all around. It was absolutely fabulous, I thrilling. Bet, I absolutely bet you went thrilling. home those nights just buzzing. I just bounced down that hill like a... <laughs> <laughs> like a 19-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it was just so exciting. It was mm. so exciting. I loved it. Mm. Um, it was not a thing that transfers very readily into print. And then I got an opportunity to, to go to Nepal with some um, uh, Italian University of Siena researchers um, who were doing it properly in Nepal, uh, you know, well-funded and well-mentored by this um, amazing um, prof they had, um, Sandro Lavari which we we became really good friends. He invited me to go to Nepal with him, and um, it was a wonderful opportunity to work with, you know, um, s such brilliant people. But and in Nepal, where the tar were, um, you know, were native, so you know, in their own landscape and their own their own patch. So that was a huge privilege. I'm really grateful for him, and I found actually. That what was what I was trying to do um, was being uh, outplayed by by far, but with what they were able to do with their better equipment and better okay. resources and all that. Wow. So um, the decision I made then was I'm not not even going to think about competing with them, writing serious science about it, but I'd transfer that into the book. So that some people would get a kick about uh, about what I was trying to do, and that was also the inspiration for Stephen in my film, um, because that showed visually what I was trying trying to say in writing, which ne never quite made it. Mm. Did you notice any differences between the native Himalayan tar in their native country and what you had seen in New Zealand, where they've had maybe a hundred years to adapt slightly? Um, the, yeah, a little bit. Um, the coloration was was slightly different, maybe because the selection was, you know, the of the originals was was fewer, and um, the Nepal populations were um, our populations were generally growing, so we had a lot of uh, animals in the younger age classes, whereas theirs was overstacked with with. Um, over mature animals and, and uh, you know the recruitment um, of kids into the population uh, in, in Nepal was um, very light because of snow leopard predation. So that's and why they, they're becoming endangered. Yeah, yeah, they, right. they've got fragmented populations over there where it had once been um, continuous. And, um, Due to snow leopards? Uh, no, the, the fragmentation is largely as a result of um, bigger and bigger populations of Nepalese people using higher country um, for crops. And, and um, so once you're in fragmented populations and, you, and then you get a little bit of predation and a little bit of a poaching, um, say, uh, in, an, in a population where the um, senior adults are overrepresented and not being recruited um, as a result of either you know predation or, or whatever. Um, it, it was quite the opposite of New Zealand in that respect. Um, so it was a real eye opener for me. But the behaviour and all the things that they were looking at was so exactly the same. Um, there was a fiercer competition over there because it was stacked with with mature animals. Was, and um, the animals weren't so shy there. Our ones flee at the drop of a hat. Maybe um, it's because of the hunting. Yeah, maybe because of the, the pressure from hunting and they get to learn. Yeah.
Whereas, um, you know, I'm very careful. When I first got there, uh, yeah, I, I stalked a bull. I was just so careful, so careful. And I got to where I could take a photograph of it. And I thought, my goodness, this is amazing. And it looked up and caught me in the eye from about 30 yards, yawned, went back to eating. And I thought, my goodness. <laughs> that, would make, oh, yeah. that would make study a whole yeah, lot easier, yeah, wouldn't it? I thought, well, I've been trying to do this on Ben McLeod Station and look what it's subjecting to me, all this indignity <laughs> of being stared at and yeah. ignored. So, uh, well, yeah, it all it made good. for a good book anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of them had a big ear tag on it. And I thought, oh, you poor thing, Mill, the indignity of being marked as well. It's not fair. <laughs> but you know, anyway. Um, I had this funny thought after reading about you know, your study of their behaviours and things. It, it would be stupid thought, but quite fun to get one of those robot dogs, drape it in a bull cape, and if you could mimic the movements and the head movements uh, and the neck movements and see if you could place that animal in amongst, you know, some 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 tar and see if it could be accepted. <laughs> I... I exactly what I really wanted to do at on Ben McLeod Station is build myself um, a hat or a helmet that had, you know, a moderately decent set of horns on it and the ca enough ma face mask and cape mm -hmm. to be, you know, to stick out the top of a tussock and actually present a target for, um, yeah, yeah, for the, uh, you know, approach of an animal itself and be treated as one yeah. um, for the purposes of photography and what's going to happen next. So my thought wasn't quite so dumb. Oh, as no, as no, as no. <laughs> it's exactly what I had in mind. I never got to do it. I never got the material in hand, and I regret that. Having said that, there was a few occasions where a tar, I was mistaken because I was well concealed, you know, by a... Um, by a tar and treated as if I was a competitor. Right. And, um, you know, I can think of a few times where, you know, he made a dummy runs at me, you know, from about five metres. Okay. And I did I did wonder, um, looked behind me to see where I might go. And I thought, on one occasion, I thought, well, they're going to find my corpse at the bottom of this bluff <laughs> and they're going to... Uh, activate my little camera and they were going to say I can see why he had the smile on his face look at this <laughs> just so exciting just yeah. so exciting and then they might think well it's evolution taking yeah. its natural <laughs> process <laughs> yeah. he's shouldn't yeah, have been there yeah. in the first place oh no uh, um, um, lovely stuff yeah, yeah. The thing is, that on that particular occasion, and I kicked myself for this, is as it got closer and closer and closer with its main erect and its little um, head nods, which said, um, you know, <laughs> I'm bigger than you, buddy, and I'm coming. <laughs> um, I, was, I kept having to zoom it out, and I'd rather have left the camera yeah. on full as it was until he, his little face filled the whole screen. <laughs> But that stage I was actually clinging to the rock with one hand too. <laughs> so, no, it's really interesting. Oh no, good fun. Yeah, really good fun. So this story um, can't be complete really without talking about how tar have been managed in New Zealand over the years. And especially in recent years where there's been a lot of controversy, so much so that um, it's led to a lot of extremely strong not just language, but hateful language and even death threats on people due to varying opinions. Um, so without getting too much into depth, I think it would be interesting just to discuss this to some extent. So would I be correct by saying pre-1993, the management of tar was essentially under control because of the, the culling operations and the 60s and 70s and even later um would that generally be correct or not yeah that's exactly right and they had an opportunity then to continue on 
with that, and the power management plan has some really nice things about it way ahead of its time. I mean, managing properly managing an animal population in New Zealand um, with respect to land tenure, numbers, values held by hunters, and so on. But they they let that override, got out of the game, and the animal populations which are capable of reproducing really smartly, you know, like doubling numbers every um, four years or so in a good habitat. Um, and so we kind of lost a really good opportunity then to to take, you know, block by block um, sensible management. It, it's not that hard really, and we had the means to do it really, with the, and the helicopter um, folk um, had shown how possible it was. So the 1993 plan, which you said was inspired, um, changed the status essentially of tar from a pest to a resource and set the maximum number at 10,000 over seven yeah. management units. Yeah. Um, and the requirements from, if I was to summarise it in one sentence, would be to monitor the tar populations, monitor the vegetation growth and regeneration, continually review the plan and consult with interested parties. It would be smack on. Um, well, in 1993, was this plan generally accepted as fair and workable by the various interested groups, generally? I believe so. I I wasn't involved because at that stage I was flying helicopters in uh, Asia. So personally, I wasn't um, part of any consultation. I do agree that the principles that they set up, that is um, management blocks that re that demanded uh, totally different sorts of management depending on whether you're willing to tolerate uh, tower or less willing to tolerate or to stop them um, animals expanding outside that range that that seemed really sensible to me and once you've got um once you've got a block and you can take a fairly good stab at the numbers in it then you've automatically got take 25 percent out each year um and you've you know you're holding station with those numbers mm. And you can you can play around with it. Um, you can let uh, you know controlling the animals with helicopter hunting um, is fine. But you can mix that with sports groups because both you can change the seasons and and so on, so that the two don't always have to uh, conflict. So in twenty twenty, when Doc announced the updated tar control plan, yep. And the projected numbers of tar by that time were maybe around thirty-five thousand tar, um, and that led to the large, large-scale culling in national parks, and then the huge protests. Yep. Um, trying to get my head around all this in a balanced fashion is really complicated. Yep. Um, but I, I've come up with three questions. Um. So first of all, why, if the plan was so inspired in 93, by 2020, why were the tar numbers so out of control? Because helicopters left them alone and, and off they went, you know, without any restraining um, force. It's a little bit like the, the same thing happened with deer and all our forests mm. and that as well. And presumably dock and whoever else was in charge of managing them including the helicopters just forgot about them and left them yeah well i didn't have any value anymore mm. um as far as but the, was it not doc's responsibility to somehow keep them under control i would have thought so mm. um and the other thing is a lot of the tar country is in um high country stations on the eastern side of the alps and many Many of those stations were, were managing um, their resident tar populations as a trophy herd for overseas hunters. Um, so more tar meant a greater contribution of mature bulls into their population. And um, the dock who had previously had 
a fairly heavy hand with all these um, stations uh, relaxed the interest in, in playing with the numbers, keeping them down, and so they were over, you know, overrun. Yeah. And during that period, was there any monitoring of tar numbers and vegetation, or was it all of a sudden a surprise in 2020 that look where we are now? No, from what I, from my understanding, is that there was continuous um, input, at least in the latter part by uh, attempts to monitor, you know, um, uh, representative blocks here and there mm. by um, annual or biannual, I can't remember, um, counts and sp spreading what they learnt from that into the general population. Um, it's a bit hard. It's a, it's, a, it's a hard task, of course, because... Uh, you know, you, you can take a catchment, which nice tussock in it, and it's three or four big bluff systems, and you know the tower will occupy the bluff systems and come in and feed on the vegetation in their vicinity. So a lot of that, a lot of a catchment might seem like it has none, but hang on a sec, each bluff system has got resident population of females and males elsewhere who will drift in and out during the rut. So when we're talking the sort of work I was trying to do with um, tar range use and numbers and trying to count them and so on, you know, who does it, at what season do you do it, um, males and females, you know, uh, live in different, different places and uh, sometimes the year they combine them and other times not. You know, there's, there's there's a lot you have to know about the animal before you can even do a decent count. Um, the spot, the counts that they did were that was really in, intelligent stuff. They had fixed points, and they went back every year and they counted what was there, and so they had a fair idea of uh, you know changing numbers. Um, but they didn't. There was no concerted effort to deal with the numbers. To, to, to deal with it. Uh, on any sort of scale. Mm. That, that's my impression, yeah. but I was a bit dislocated. In saying that, I was a bit dislocated personally yeah, because sure. I was away. Yeah. I mean, you can see both sides of the argument. For whatever reason, the numbers were allowed to increase, and therefore, um, as you say, there's there's an increase in commercial businesses around those tar, yep. um, which, is, which is fine. And then on the other hand, once Doc realised, well, this is out of control, we need to get it back to those 1993 numbers, we're required to do something about it now. Yeah. Um, and now you've got the debate. Yeah. <laughs> and <clears throat> and, and the, the nastiness that starts happening. Yeah. We got used to high numbers again and high sportsman success and a high value placed on that sport. Um, and then um, the high value placed on overseas hunting, both you know, philosophically, is a high value and a high value for those that participated in um, making it happen. So, Doc made it very hard for themselves by delaying management. At an earlier time, it would have been easier, and then it became hard, and then it was fiddling with people's lifestyles. Um, and incomes and even existence uh, as a business and um, that's that's where your fractures and um, <laughs> you know anger and communication and all that lapsed mm. so it, it seems to me from a complete outsider's perspective the the issue here if anyone's to find some common ground hunters need to realize that conservation values need to be protected. Yes. That's a requirement. Um, and Doc needs to understand that tar aren't simply a pest, yes. um, but should be treated as a resource um, yes. because, you know, there's all the values that you talk about in your book of being in the outdoors and yep. um, having young people out learning hunting and then there's the commercial values. Um, so they're a resource um, and there needs to be an agreed number of animals maintained where everyone can essentially have a win. Yep, very fair. Mm. That's a very fair thing. I think the 93 
um, uh, management plan was the first of anything to come up with saying and acknowledge the animals are here and here for good. Right. Okay, forget, you know, extermination and all the stuff which had been talked about beforehand. And then you get into, right, how do we manage what we've got? And there's a mosaic of different things in a national park you want, want minimum. In one country which has already had 130 years of merino use, not so important. And and I guess one issue is the whole issue of dock targeting uh, bull tars in the national parks. Um, the plan says the target is zero, um, but they've been allowed to increase. And the other issue I see is Eugenie Sage, who was driving this, um, you know, seemed to have an attitude that the best tar is a dead tar, and yeah. that doesn't align with them being a resource. No. So there's... Um, you know, there's varying levels of how her view aligns with the plan. Yeah, uh, exactly that. I kind of like, personally, I like the idea of um, some of our wild animals managed as a, a recreational visual asset, not even hunted. Um, because I think that's part of the thrill of going into the hills and seeing wild animals. And you, it doesn't need, it's greater value even if there's not that many because it makes the the prize uh, even more special. Um, but people on a mission like that might not mix easily with hunting um, just as, you know, trampers in a hut often don't, enjoy the presence of hunters in a hut because the two have got kind of different values so you know i'm wondering in places that are that are popular with tar we can't partition in time rather than in space um you know user user inputs um so that keep the trophy hunting um when the animals at the finest pelage and during the rut for example when the males mingle with females keep those two months for hunters only but actually spare hunting in other seasons where dad and, and the two boys might like to go and camp in a hut um and and get a big kick out of climbing a hill with a pair of binoculars and watching a chamois or or a couple of tar or or whatever, but they don't have to have huge numbers for that. Mm. Um, and that's sort of, I'd just like to close off this um, section by reading out something you wrote. It was actually in your Wild Moose Chase book about game management. Game management does not necessarily mean more animals. In many cases, it means fewer or close to none at all. It does mean that each of the various species is considered as a resource and that goals are set for harvesting where appropriate, that population levels are deliberately are deliberated and maintained by reason, not by default, and that the annual increment is harvested sometimes by more than one user. And I thought that was just a nice, um, you know, well-rounded description of game game management that possibly um, applies here. Well, I wrote that a few years ago, and that's exactly how I think now. Mm. So that's section one of your life. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, um, it's hard to know where to start and finish, <laughs> but can we move on to section two? I've, I've come up with the numbers. Um, and that's your helicopter career, okay. which um, is a book in itself. It's a story in itself, but we'll try and condense it into yep. a short period of time. So you learned to fly, I think, in 1972, and you said you bought shares in a Bolco aircraft. Yep. And you made a curious comment about it. <laughs> you probably can't remember. You said, Charlie Juliet Foxtrot is the only piece of machinery I've ever loved. <laughs> oh, yes. I think that's that's true. I mean, I had a good colleague and friend, and we used to enjoy our deer hunting. We weren't making very much money for forest service but um we found if we went deer shooting which was a joy in itself um pulled the carcasses out sold them um then it would help us in other aspects of our life as well and so we bought a little old land rover with proceeds and then we uh, my friend 
be, began taking flying lessons because he thought that was um, a nice way to, to spend the money we were making. <laughs> Get rid of the money quickly. And he talked me into it and, and off I went. And then the two of us decided after a while when we got a few more skills, wouldn't it be fun to have one of our own? So we found that we, we could buy a little Bolko, Bolko Jr. for um, $3,600, which equated to, I can't remember, 36 deer or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, we bought this quaint little aeroplane and um, parked it in a paddock uh, in, at, at Cust near his house. And um, yeah, had a lot of fun with it. In the end, in the end I didn't. I can't remember how, I probably for less than 100 hours, but it certainly, we used it as a way to spot deer in places we were going to hunt and have a bit of fun and learn some skills. And then um, I worked, in the course of the tar job, I worked with helicopter pilot operators who were um, who were hunting for meat, the tar, in those important years, 71 to 75. Mm-hmm. And I thought, helicopters are changing things here. Wouldn't And my interest in aviation had um, started with Aero Club, Wee Bolko. Um, I got my commercial um, pilot's license because I had so much levering, and I thought this will help my flying. And in working with the helicopter boys, I, th- I think I'd love to take a few years off get into the helicopter game now that they were catching animals alive. So it was the beginning of a process and not shooting them dead, which was the end, and um, become enough part of the industry to have a decent look at it because I thought that would help my science in the future and I'd know exactly how things worked. Well, I kind of did that. Um, I wanted to do it before I was... 35, which I thought would be too old to be a new helicopter pilot, so dead on my age, 34, I sold my house, um, left uh, left forest service, some things still unwritten, um, but I was going to attend to that, and um, through the kindness of Tim Wallace's Alpine group, and I already knew Tim from other days, um, offered me a job um, in the deer game, starting at Queenstown to get a little bit of um, time up my sleeve and some tuition was much needed. And uh, uh, I think I you said you had 100 or 90 hours total time. Yeah, yeah. In those days, helicopters were just a rating on an aircraft, on an aeroplane license. And that's why I was in a bit of a hurry to sneak it in before it went as a license of its own, which required 200 hours. So 50 hours later. Um, yeah, I did it. <laughs> well, what was it like working for Tim? He saw me as operating a ground shooting team, which I think was to help phase me in, uh, using um, skilled hunters and darts, radio darts, and I was given a hiller, uh, 300 at first, and then I decided a hiller and sent to Haast and uh, work ground ground teams and they would I'd drop them off they'd hunt deer in the bush ping a dart into one uh, beep 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 I'd hover over the top drop my chain they'd hook it on they'd keep hunting I'd fly off for surprise um, and that that was one of Tim's um, he thought a workable dream well was it workable and was it a dream? <laughs> it was a dream and and, and and it wasn't workable for, for me. <laughs> I got to Haast, I think, with uh, seven hours on the hiller and four of them were sort of getting there <laughs> and, and launched um, with uh, a shooter, uh, for, one for a start and then very quickly about uh, three others. Um, we f- we very quickly found that the the darting didn't work for us because you know you're firing a projectile like a brick at an animal, which is um, 
kind of 30 yards away, uh, you know, from the air, you can just pop it on its bum from six feet. You know, if you're ground hunting, you've got to do it with great care. And, and of course, if it raced off with its dart beeping, you, you still had to recover it. And I was supposed to fly over the beep and drop a chain through the canopy. Well, we ended up with uh, 120 foot of chain um, in order to get through the canopy. Uh, difficult, I couldn't, because this hill you sit center seat, I couldn't see out. Um, and of course, when you pull above the canopy with a deer underneath, you lose all um, contact with visibility. So it's a thing you really want to, on 500, you can lean out the door and pull it all together. So you're just flying blind, really? So, so I was flying blind, and I didn't have the skills. And I, how could I, you know, because I hadn't flown enough to um, get the whole thing together. We pulled it, we started pulling it off a bit. And instead of using darts, we got the boys were using dogs. Um, so if they darted something, they'd track it with a dog. And then handheld radios, which didn't work either very well because, you know, with the thunder of noise and thrashing vegetation under the rotor disc, you know, and little guys shouting into their tiny radios and me trying to hear it through my helmet. Uh, <laughs> It didn't. We were starting to put it together a little bit better when the price dropped, and that was the end of that. So I ended up, you know, with some good at 120 odd hours in the hiller, which was really, really useful in very difficult conditions. Um, so Tim had to come and deliver the bad news. That oh yeah, no, no. Anymore. Tim was very gracious. He invited me um, to his house in Wanaka. We sat in his den with a couple of very huge whiskies, And um, we had such a lovely chat for about an hour and a half, and it wasn't until I was driving away I, I realised I'd been sacked. <laughs> <laughs> so, what a nice guy. <laughs> yeah. It, it felt almost like promotion. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, I'd committed everything at that stage, um, and I, I didn't have enough hours to be a saleable pilot, and besides the industry was changing. So... I did go through um, a period of a uh, short period of anxiety, and I got invited back to do another degree at uh, university, turn the tar work and, uh, into a master or a PhD. But then I decided, uh, uh, no, I've made this change. I've got to see it through. And then a week later, that after that, I can remember being in the head of the wills. Uh, Wills Valley near Makarora on a frosty morning um, trying to skin frozen possums thinking what on earth are you doing here which is exactly what my mother and father had said a few months a few six months previously when I jumped onto the um, helicopter game anyway no we we um, got over a few difficult years and I got kind of better. I did a season at Makarora, um, working largely with a mining company in a huge 500, and that put me back on track. That was the, the flying part was quite demanding. And Who were you um, working for then? I was working for Southern Alps Air Charter then, based out of Makarora. They had a um, um, a couple of mall air, aircraft uh, doing scenics and bush flying with with people and I backed them up for a su half a summer with the Hughes 500 we you know made up a little um, scenic spot scenic flight for some of the bus group tour people that, that went through Makarora in summer so that was Larry Larravee yeah, was that it was that Larry you were Larravee. mentioning earlier yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you must have got back into some animal um, recovery work um, and I can't quite remember from the book where it lined in, but there's some stories about um, carrying yeah. 17 goats in the back of a helicopter oh, yeah. <laughs> and jumping on deer from the... Yeah, that's right. Um, a year or so, a year after that, uh, things went pretty quiet for a while, and then um, I got a chance through... Heli skiing was developing in Wanaka, and Tim was getting sick of trying to meet helicopter commitments as well as 
um, the rest of his dear uh, um, investments and things. So I took over the everyday flying from Wanaka that Tim normally did. And so that was everything. That was um, the beginning of, beginnings of heliski, and it was, you know, mustering on the farms, and it was a little bit of placement for fishermen and climbers, and, you know, some photography and some firefighting and that sort of thing. So uh, we had the helicopter parked in the backyard of, of the house at, at Wanaka, and we just, you know, ran the operation from there that Tim had previously run from home. It was ski field development too in those years. This was sort of 1980 to uh, to about um, 2000, um, the early years especially when everything was developing and on the go. So I got into flying th with that, and then um, part of the Alpine Helicopters Dash Worldwide Helicopters Group got opportunity to work with um, seismic uh, oil exploration, size, on onshore seismic exploration, and we did that in Taranaki and Gisborne and Southland and back to Taranaki and Gisborne and back to Taranaki again okay. over a period of years. Um, and that was full on. That was absolutely full on. That was flying 500s, um, was it 10 days on, 10 days off, um, eight plus hours a day, um, never quite enough time to finish, just full on. Mm -hmm. And that really was how I got my teeth into serious flying. It was difficult weather, it was all conditions, it was small spots, it was heavy loads, it was everything crammed into a real short space. So by the, by the time I stepped out of um, that era with the, with the worldwide crew, yeah, I probably had 4,000 hours on a 500 and you could do most things on it. You were very comfortable with pulled it on like a glove every morning yeah. and flew your heart out all day. and. After a week or ten days, you went home in full exhaustion, and ten days later, you came back and did it again. Very, very uh, um, uh, amazing to have so much experience um, gained, serious experience in such a short time, demanding flying, um, but fabulous for a guy that was, you know, trying to get himself sorted out. Yeah, sure. In the meantime, yeah, I'd been trying to write up the the tower work and a few other things. I got some help for some ex, from some ex-colleagues and got it to the stage where for the professional scientific, science publications, I felt myself um, vindicated. I'd done what I'd promised myself I'd do, brought it up to scratch. And um, so that was that was really a difficult time to try and work both things, mm. but mm. between uh, with some help from friends, managed that, so... Yes, I was in the helicopter game then, and seriously, and all, all thoughts of it becoming um, uh, part-time while I stepped back into science were gone, because as you grow up in the helicopter game and get more experience, you get more valued, you can do things, um, and um, you get, uh, you know, the confidence that goes with doing things and the, doing it well as you can and uh, working amazing places with good colleagues and doing exciting stuff. Yeah, loved it. Can we talk about a few interesting um, incidents, if, for want of a better word, that, yeah, yeah, that yeah. you mentioned? So one was having um, diving onto the backs of goats and having oh, 17 yeah. of them in the cargo <laughs> compartment. <laughs> goats. Goats were such fun. Um, yeah, following up on, on the... Farming of deer quickly came a farming of goats, and catching wild goats for a few years was, you know, was a thing, a great thing. Uh, such a fun thing. <laughs> so we'd be invited to. Do, I, I never do it. Uh, I did it, you know, um, as a as a commercial job, not as a, um, you know, participant in in the way that you. That was for you. We charged hourly rate, and we caught yep. goats yep. on people's properties for them. And I had um, my amazing sidekick, John Muir, um, in between 
we made quite a deadly team once we got to a, a, a farmer's property. We recruited a couple of his hardiest looking musterers and we we jumped on the helicopter and off we went and uh, flew over the back of a goat and the, the one who was nearest the door dropped onto it and the next one shifted seats and so on. We didn't used to, we found it wasn't necessary to tie them or to um, colour, uh, you know, blindfold them or anything. We had a third person sitting in the back and we, we um, just stuffed them in the back one after the other. <laughs> um, yeah, the most I ever got um, in one load was 17, which was quite a few. Um, one or two. We, yeah, we were staggering down with about 12 on and we fought, saw a few more easy ones. <laughs> so we dropped in, in the back too. I can remember there was so much noise coming out of the back. Normally the transmission makes a lot of row in a, in a Hughes 500 but this wasn't transmission. <laughs> I'm not sure whether it was the guy in the back or the goats that were doing the most squealing. <laughs> you'd just you'd come back with tears of laughter rolling down your face. <laughs> the poor guy's covered, smelling like goats, of course, and covered in bruises and scratches, yeah. which is a good reason to become a pilot. That's right. <laughs> you get the right seat. And you wrote an interesting little paragraph about doing a similar thing for deer. Yeah. Um, the job of catching live deer for other people often had uncomfortable overtones. That was because time is money, big money in helicopters, and it was easy to fall below clients' expectations. Nobody likes paying for nothing, and finding nothing was always easier than finding something. <laughs> Mostly it happened when someone had seen a few deer handy to their fence line and wished to transfer ownership of them from God to themselves. But the deer, always scarce, always wisely, nearly always failed to cooperate. A quick sprint into a Manuka gully and it was all over. Right. <laughs> Quite funny. I wrote that a while ago and it was nothing true. <laughs> there was another story, um, too, in fact, of animals that had uh, got loose in the cockpit. Oh. One, a dog, I think. And from memory, you were stooging in a, in a foggy area all committed with no options was that something like that it was one of the very fairly <clears throat> the very first times when tim uh, rang me up and said on the words kind of i'm out of this you can um you can do all the flying now tell ring up these people and tell them not to ring me tell them you know that you'll do the flying for them so uh one of the very early calls in autumn you know stations doing their mustering um me and tim's big shoes trying to follow what he used to do so yeah i got this call mustering up the cadrona thank you very much land here so i flew up and found the paddock and there was uh three men and about oh i don't know eight dogs or something um it was a nasty little norwester blowing and so I thought, oh, well, I'll land short and I'll get out of the helicopter and I'll just go and brief them. It looks like two reasonable loads. And I was halfway through pulling the harness off and the doors swung open and um, big brawny arms threw dogs in and dogs ran out the other door or jumped back in or had to be chased. And um, large men with the hill sticks and swan dries jammed in and um, one of them pointed up the hill because there's quite a bit of noise <laughs> in the 500. And so it was staggered off the ground, heart in the mouth, um, heading in a sort of a gusty nor'wester um, up the Cadrona uh, till we got to about 6,000 feet. And uh, the pointy bit went to landing between two big um, rock columns. Uh, just a flattish sort of a place. Um, <laughs> so I positioned myself as best as I could, nose into wind, um, and started to let down much faster than I thought when a dog in the back, deciding that this was his day to, on the hill, which he couldn't quite wait for and the ground was close enough, decided to leap over the back seat, clamber over the back of my helmet, uh, get tangled up in the cord that, that um, was the radio 
um, collapsed onto my lap, um, just a mass of writhing little hard feet and writhing fur and wagging tail. Well, it did the wall of death around the cockpit and then jammed itself under the pedals. In the meantime, of course, I was I was coming in um, very late, uh, heading for this flattish bit of hill between these two bloody big rock columns. So we hit it um, harder than I would have liked, but everyone scrambled out and waved me off and uh, I went home and had a nice cup of tea. <laughs> but that was kind of my introduction to uh, filling Tim's big shoes with local jobs. And I thought I had it sorted, but I didn't. I was, uh, then did my own briefings. <laughs> And there was another occasion, was it a deer got loose in the oh, cockpit? that was a... Sorry, I'm probably bringing no. back terrible memories for you. <laughs> no. no, it's funny because this is why I wrote the book. You see, the lessons I have learnt um, for for new pilots that might be obliged to carry these things out without having been briefed, <laughs> as, as it always worked, seemed to work for me. No, the um, other one was when I first picked up the hiller to go to Haast, um, and Hiller was new to me, um, so yeah, and, and was thinker of a Norwest blowing, and I was to leave Queenstown Airport, go through the Cadrona saddle, drop off two newly caught fawns who, who were tied up in a cardboard box um, to uh, a girl at Criffle Station near Wanaka who was looking after the um, the fawns that had been caught, wild caught, but had to be separated from their mums because of the trauma of the whole thing. And she was bringing up, you know, loads of these little guys. And then I was just to fly off and go to house and start my job in the hiller. Anyway, I was clattering over the um, uh, Cadrona saddle in high wind, the heart and mouth quite close to the ground. And the hiller felt fairly unfamiliar. In the cardboard box, um, we went into great big lurch of the gust of wind and the box slid off the seat and fell on the floor and it pulsed for a while and then a little head stuck out and then came a set of legs and this um, uh, little fawn kicked off its foot tie and then uh, again did the wall of death about 25 times around the inside of the bubble as as it trampled me going from left to right and right to left and left to right again just a ball of muscle little hard hooves screeching its head off and again jammed itself under the pedals I couldn't quite reach. So uh, I was already slightly anxious about my first job and my first um, uh, decent flight in, in the hill that wasn't training only and um, somehow I slithered the, the aircraft onto the ground at, at Criffle Station and <laughs> left my two little companions, the second one which was already uh, um, got out of the box and was doing jackknifes all over the floor, <laughs> shrieking its head off, but fortunately its leg ties stayed on. So, <laughs> so things flying around in the in the cabin with legs um, seemed to be my fate on the Cadrona. I was a bit more careful after that, but uh, you need you need to prep these jobs yourself and not have other people do it for you. That was the lesson. Yeah. <laughs> Right, there's a few more. Oh, okay. Good fun <laughs> listening to them 40 years later. Um, one occasion in a 500, I think, where you, Tim, asked you to move a big rock on his property. Oh. And ended up in a bit of disaster. Oh, I did. I did. Um, Tim was building his new house on, on Criffle Station at a lower level, and they were doing some rock work, um, some stonework for the walls and, and things. And he had, he had sent a, a chap up on these um, small screes, and he was gathering stones that would suit the rock walling and putting them in a, in a um, small net because it was heavy loads. And uh, I... I I was to just do what Tim had been doing the last few days because Tim was away. Pick, find the guy, pick up his, what loads he'd already made up, fly them back to the household site, drop them on the ground. 
Um, so that that was my mission. I picked up the, the 500 and I was a bit uneasy with it. I was uneasy enough that I put my helmet on because usually with a 500, if you can, you don't have a helmet because you've got to, if you're doing sling work, you've got to duck your head under the door and with a helmet on, it, it's quite difficult. But without a helmet on, it's easy anyway. I put my helmet on, which turned out to be a good thing. <laughs> And flew and found this character, and, and he'd been making up loads for little nets with stones suitable for rock walling, but larger than normal rock, had slid down and fouled the net, and he was unable to hook it on. Um, and without having a radio, we could just do hand signals, and I thought I might be able to, if he hook, hooked that, rock on that has fouling the net um, I might better shift it aside and we could hook the other one on um, so anyway we didn't have a long strop which was a silly but timid sort of organised everything to get him to hook the rock on I had to go really low, I have to watch the blade tips while he struggled to, to put the short strop with this larger than normal rock on it looked like about the same as a normal load or too wide because i knew i could take it uh, put a bit of power on it, and if it was um over the you know heading towards the limit i'll just back it off and we'd get on with it, the rest of the job anyway he eventually got it hooked on um i took enough weight off the rock that started to slither backwards dragging me with it i buttoned it I went to batten it off, it wouldn't work. I went to batten it off, it still wouldn't work. I was still sliding backwards down down the hill and my blades were getting bloody close to where this guy was crouching. Um, then the rock swung free and it was the, the load was too heavy, so of course the, um, the aircraft started to rotate, uh, dragging me backwards all the time. And then there was... Um, series of thumps and bangs and crashes and I kept thinking as I was heading downhill backwards fast this is the landscape flashing by <laughs> that we were part way through renovating one of the bedrooms in our house at home and that I was going to be in a bloody wheelchair and I was still only halfway through the jib stopping but anyway um, the aircraft went backwards did a few turns and ended up upside down and there's a dead silence except for the old um, um, fuel uh, <laughs> fuel, fuel button yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tick, tick 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 um, um, so I was careful to un unlatch my um, harness so that I didn't fall on my head I thought about that which was good and clambered out of out of the machine and it caught fire, so I went back to the helicopter and fumbled around till I got the, the um, extinguisher out and put it up the uh, 500's backside and gave it a good squirt. So that was that sort of sorted. And then I had to climb the hill past this guy who has been watching this with absolute horror, but he still had a head, so that was re refreshing. Um, I walked past him without saying a word and jogged down the road <laughs> to, to where, where I, th I was aiming for the house site so I could tell him I was, I was okay. Meantime, of course, they'd heard the thump and the bang and rang the um, uh, um, fire brigade. So as I was jogging down the road, I heard the fire, uh, the fire engine starting up and I thought, oh, buddy, Mag, she was going to get such a fright. <laughs> anyway... Um, yeah, it worked out that um, we'd, I'd made a big, big mistake not planning, not planning the job myself, um, not having the right kit, not having a chance to brief the guy on the ground, but, uh, um, having uh, what appeared to be a hook failure. But in fact, those sorts of hooks with that um, load on them. Uh, as we found on the size it worked frequently didn't um, under load they wouldn't release but if you relieved the load of course they would um, so there was lots and lots of lessons in that but I, I regret and I was totally ashamed of crashing 
um, Tim's helicopter. He was very gracious about it. He was very gracious about it. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> One more, um, which has a really good lesson about knowing your limits. Um, you did quite a bit of firefighting. Yep. Um, and there was one story where you'd been out fighting a fire all morning, early in the morning before dark, I think, and then you had gone out heli skiing all day. Yep. And the fire was still going, and you got um, called in after the ha heli yep. skiing to go back and help. Rex Dovey was yep. um, the was guy it? on the spot. Yep. And there were fire crew on the ground in the middle of it, <clears throat> and. I think you had a bit of a go, but you were just beyond being useful. And you called up Rex and said, Rex, I'm sorry, I'm stuffed, I'm feeling dangerous, I'm going home. Still knowing that that fire crew was on the ground yep. in the middle of that and what that meant. Um, and I think you mentioned that was a, a point where you had genuine fear. Yes. But, I mean, what a good lesson. And knowing your limits on that occasion. Oh, yeah, that that was a hard lesson. It was a different fire, actually. Um, we had to, dra uh, it was a jet ranger who had to drag um, water out of the lake in the dark, uh, or lit only by the, by the fire itself. I'd just started, and Rex, who was flying alongside, said, um, I wouldn't get so close to the flames if I was you. He said, because you can um, suck in a whole, you know, the old um, intake, you can suck in a, a burst of hot air and you'll flame out. So that added a little bit um, of height to my next run or two. And he said, you want to watch out, there's a set of wires run through this uh, place too. So, you know, um, uh, and um, a few other little things like that. James so it Wilson. was, yeah, genuine, very, very uh, tense stuff. And I was so new to it. I only fought one fire before. And uh, so, and, and the other thing at night, you know, you're coming in on flame, um, but as you turn off, you go into night again. So I put all those together. I felt very dangerous. And so I apologised to Rex and went, and I think he did after. Uh, the, the team that were on the ground came out as I was f flying off. I was so relieved to hear, and Rex flagged it too. And when we look at what we were trying to save, you know, on those hills um, close to Makaroa, it was kind of a little patch of bracken, really, or, or high gorse, a bit of bracken, a set of wires running through it. I mean, heck. What do we do that for? <laughs> I'm sure he appreciated your decision. Well, I hope he did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, yeah, those are the sort of things when I, when I write the book, um, thinking of other pilots, you know, without being adequately briefed or trained, thrust into a situation where you make the best of it, but sooner or later, knowing when to say stop yeah. was is really important. And it's very, it's very hard, especially search and rescue, where there's someone at the other end who might be hurting, and uh, you, search and rescue, you always take it beyond, and you have to, uh, really, beyond where you're happy with um, because of the situation and that, but there still is a point where you say, this is enough for me, thank you. Mm. Um, Something you said about search and rescue was interesting. You said in the course of many Recreational and other activities, people elect to take certain risks. In an emergency call-out, the others who are compelled to tidy up after their stuff-ups have no such luxury. Exactly. And that's the pressure you were talking about. Exactly that, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, just another really good um, paragraph, which doesn't apply just to helicopter flying, but to all sorts of aviation, um, regarding gaining experience and, yep. and new time pilots trying to build up that experience. But you said, of course, without extending our experience, we'd be frozen into inertia at whatever plateau we'd be comfortable with. But to extend too much, too fast or too soon risks being zapped ourselves. It's judging the grey area and working gently into the unknown. So that too may be, then be relegated into history. That speaks progress and maturity, but it's a bloody sight harder than it sounds.
<laughs> and that's every young pilot's challenge, exactly. isn't it? It is exactly. People say, what's the hardest thing about flying a helicopter? Thinking, you know, um, aircraft management, you know, control, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I said, always say, you know, knowing when to say stop. Mm. True. Yeah. yeah. Um, things are much better these days. I mean, the companies are much more professional. The backup is much better. The um, communications much better. Mentoring is um, compulsory. Um, so in those days, search and rescues, we used to call them snatch and grabs if you could finish it off quickly before the operation had to get, get too big. But um, but you were thrust very quickly into um, uh, difficult situations and just letting them play out and, and how you fitted in and what you could do safely without risking yourself or importantly the other people that were with you that were really important um you spent five seasons flying in antarctica again another book in itself <laughs> uh, four for the italians and one for helicopters new zealand what is it about antarctica that um is so special to you ah uh, if you love mountains you will love antarctica uh, it is just amazing, just this glittering, endless landscape. The colours unimaginable um, in, in life. You know, the, the blacks and whites, sure, but, the, you know, the turquoises, the light, the, everything. The wildlife, which just clusters around your knees as if, we, you know, they don't even care anymore. Um, just... Uh, Landscape, seascape, um, wildlife, uh, history. Mm. Oh, fabulous. You mentioned. I've been very lucky, if of, of great privilege to fly in Antarctica. And um, yeah, I love the history. Um, I, I took with me all the books I could find uh, that, that the heroic age explorers had written themselves, their own. Um, their own accounts and and of course when you're on those same sites you can relive it so you went them. to several of those sites and huts oh and... yes oh yeah all the huts and we I actually found some sites uh you know that hadn't been found before by simply following up um you know the landscape at that time of the year where it might be oh there it was you know uh, um yeah. a cairn or a, yeah. or a um, food drop or you know places of which uh -huh. are still there a hundred years later yes exactly, exactly as, as they were left weathered but as they were left in fact as a result of one of them they retrieved it for the uh, Christchurch um, Museum but yeah again you know how special is that that you could go into it in more detail but you'll get you'll get the drift, you know, and Antarctica doesn't change. Um, but but the Italian job was special because it was two things, you know, it was like living in Italy and it was like flying in Antarctica. And we were, as pilots, the, the Antarctica, uh, as pilots with the Italians, they were a bit more cavalier, perhaps than the... Um, you know, American, New Zealand expeditions, they let us take a much more, because Italians weren't so used to it, they let us um, make more decisions and braver ones perhaps of where we could go and all that. So uh, um, it was a, worked, worked out to be very, very successful. You see, with, An with Antarctica, um, every job that, that you can't do from base requires a helicopter. So we took part in everybody's projects, but never got bogged down in any of them. Yeah. So that was a, that was very special. And the Italians are gorgeous, you know. They're so generous and um, great, great fun. Mm. Yeah, I loved Antarctica. What are the um, if you look at the flying and the differences in flying there between back home, 
what are the differences in the different types of risk mitigations because of the terrain yeah. and the yeah. coldness and the remoteness? I would say um, uh, it's clear, uh, not necessarily in order of importance, clear air where distance was um, air so clear that distance was uh, really deceptive. You look over the other side of the glacier uh, uh, and it looks like it's 10 miles, but in fact it's 25 kind of thing. Um, you look at a wee black dot in, in the snow, is it something the size of a tennis ball um, 100 yards away, or is it a nun attack, you know, 15 miles kind of thing. Surprising. White, uh, white outs, bright outs, which is much the same. Um, you know, flying over expanses of of snow without mark or shadow or anything, gauging distances uh, is tricky. Wind that you can't read um, is is tricky. Uh, temperature, everything it takes a heck of a lot longer. Um, for the engineers, things like. Um, your, your uh, rubber seals and things, uh, you know, can crack and you yeah. l lose a bit of oil and uh, they keep a close watch on that kind of stuff. Um, fuel, always a problem because you do a lot of long distance stuff. Um, so you're often dropping drums off in a remote place and sometimes okay. a place that you didn't do the drop off yourself, will I find it kind of thing. The mm. first season I did, we didn't have GPS, and um, that was uh, very testing sometimes, especially if you're looking for something that dropped off the previous season, like a fuel drop. Um, all the other years we did, and, and it was such a great relief mm. to, uh, to work with GPS. Um, you talk yeah. about an incident... Um, that you had, I think from memory it might have been on your last trip where you crash landed a squirrel onto the pad. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which could have ended up so much worse. Oh yeah, gosh yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was that was the second trip I I did. The first trip I did, I found Antarctica really intimidating, and the second I wanted to go immediately on the second trip to feel more comfortable with it. Um, and, and that worked. And the third trip, I said, well, that's good. I'm much happier now in Antarctica. That, but I'd hate to be leader of the the pack, you know, the leader, not the, the senior pilot because of all the decisions and stuff that he made. So the third trip I did, I was leader of the pack. Uh, the fourth trip I did was a remote camp middle of the Shackleton Glacier working with more Americans. Um, fa fantastic because it was not a base anymore, it was a distant camp. Um, the fifth trip was back with the Italians because they wanted somebody that had you know, been there before a bit and liked them. So that, that was my five trips. The, the incident um, that you're referring to, yeah, was um, a load, we're do, doing a ship to shore transfer, boat ship to shore transfer on Christmas Day, it was actually. High above the camp, one person on board waiting for the helicopter to lift off the single wooden pad. Um, all the other people crowded around the pad, I mean, 30 or 40 yards away, safely, um, to, um, to to load, get back to the ship, have Christmas dinner, <laughs> whatever it was. So I was halfway uh, in a turn, and the, suddenly the old um, um, beeper started shrieking. Uh, the low, the low RPM beeper, which was, you know, it was kind of on a low power setting, just just coming in a curve, and um, I realised that something very seriously was wrong. And what was wrong actually is that um, one of the drive shafts had separated, so although the engine was running, um, the rotors weren't being powered mm. by the shaft, there was a separation there, and the aircraft, having left New Zealand and all, had only done 27 hours 
So, uh, you know, it, it, it was a um, mm. unexpected issue. None of those things are expected, of course. Yeah. So here I, I was sort of above the base, um, quite high, starting a turn in front of me was uh, just uh, water, uh, seawater, but with broken ice on it, little blocks the size of a bed, say, but thousands of them, mm. nothing you could do anything with. I could turn back to the camp, but in a turn I'd lose more revs. Um, and there was, you know, the pad on the middle, a wooden pad, and um, perhaps 60 people crowded behind it about 40 yards away. Uh, and either side of the, the pad were rocks the size of buses or houses. So it was actually, uh, what what do I call it? Um, we have two choices and neither of them, <laughs> neither of them are very attractive. Anyway, we sort of lined up. Um, I, gathered as much revs as I, as I thought I could for my stop, lined up the pad and whacked onto it, slithered off, um, bent a few things. But uh, fortunately, one of the engineers who was waiting to load the people saw or heard that I was coming in um, underpowered and too, much too fast and um, ushered all the people quickly out the back. So okay. in fact... Uh, that was one huge worry of how I was going to land and if I was going to um, uh, imperil anybody else. I had it kind of sorted. I'd land short but hard and messy. Or if I could make the pad, fine. If I slithered off it, I still had a little bit of room before uh, I messed everyone up. Anyway. So there, that was an awkward, an awkward um Landing one they didn't want on a Christmas day, that's for sure. Mm. So there was a yeah, there was a bit of um, no one. Oh, the the guy that sat with me had never been in a helicopter before. He was on a ship's crew, just coming in for a look. Was he wondering if this is normal? Uh, when I when I whack, went down with an enormous whack, and he lurched forward a bit and cut his knee on um, on that little shelf they have in front of the screws. I said. I don't normally land like that, Martin. <laughs> and I could see by his face that he knew that already. <laughs> but, but oh yeah, and it's so a, a crash in Antarctica. It's there's that aircraft out for the season. But it could have been so much worse oh, if you were twenty miles from. Oh base. yeah, uh, uh, when I think of the twenty-seven hours that had been accrued before that uh, separation happened. We were flying off the boat, uh, looking for leads through the sea ice. Heavens, we did. We dropped some um, radio equipment on top of Mount Melbourne, which was like a nine thousand footer, um, in order that the camp had communications. And between the camp and Mount Melbourne was, you know, just a huge crevassed area, vast, vast cre crevasses. You'd fit a bus sideways on them and you wouldn't touch the sides, kind of stuff. Oh, other places, you know, uh, for a few recce trips we did, I was so lucky that that happened there and so lucky that um, it was manageable into the sea. We had no equipment where anybody could have got a boat. You couldn't float a boat on that icy stuff. Neither could you land on any of the squares. They were too small. Um, you know, we just tipped over instantly. So, yeah, I was very fortunate there. So, um, finishing the Antarctica story, following that, you spent some time in Burma and Laos. Yes. Um, which, talking to you last night and at other times, it seems like um, very close to your heart, some of these areas and the people you met. Yes. Um so what what can you say about your time in Burma? 18 months, I think, and Marg wasn't with you. Was that right? That's right, yeah. We, f we flew in Burma on seismic oil exploration, working with the companies, overseas companies, which we'd worked with in New Zealand. That was the link. Um, that Burma has, was under strict military control. It had shut itself off from the 1960s on. The generals were running out of oil. Um, prices were good. 
and they let some international companies in for oil exploration, thinking that they could do joint deals with them if if we found anything. And and Burma does have a history of oil from British colonial days. So we went working with a French company called CGG, um, and they in turn, in the blocks that I worked with, worked for a big um, South Korean company called Yangon, uh, called um, uh, something like that, I can't remember. Anyway, um, uh, in, in the end, yeah, for 18 months, take the monsoon out, we were doing months on, months off trips um, and working in the Chindwin River area near the Indian border in the northwest um, with ground crews that reached up to a thousand uh, working under the canopy, doing everything by hand, the cables and the geophones and all the other things that go wow. with seismic work. And, um, what could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, we were, we were, so we were servicing them with uh, equipment and camp equipment and so on, if they could cut a little hole in the bush for, big enough for us to land on or on escarpments or riverbeds or, or whatever. Um, Burma, well, the Europeans have been booted out in the 1960s. We were there in quite a remote place working amongst little villages. It, you looked on it and thought, what century is this? Um, bullet carts, the odd bicycle, uh, the the vehicles that were around, that were owned by locals at all were um, ex-World War II Japanese or British transports, which were largely a skeleton with an engine on the back uh, and wired or bambooed together. And this atrocious looking wreck spurting black smoke and steam would come charging out of the undergrowth sometimes. Um, elephants, logging, all that stuff. Pythons. A few. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually snakes, quite a few. Actually, yeah, yeah quite a few. <laughs> it's a story in itself. So uh, that drop, dropping and working in that landscape for me was just fabulous. I just loved it. I just loved it. The uh, military and officialdom aside, the um, the people were just magical. You didn't we didn't share a language most of the time. Although the British colonials had left English with some old uh, older folk, but it it kind of didn't matter. It was just so gorgeous, um, and the work was uh, was really challenging. And the heat and the rain, and uh, and all that stuff. But yeah, I I just I just loved it. At one stage, oh, for a good part of that 18 months, we were based in a class in a village or a cluster of little villages around, and um, we it was like a spaceship arrival when the helicopters arrived, <laughs> um, and only the old people had ever seen a European before, but um, we were just loved to death. Those of us that cared uh, were invited into people's homes and to take part in all their family events and things. It was just so lovely. I had a little group of kids, just tiny tots, who I used to always engage with them, and they were they were special. We called the other boys called them the fan club, but they were hilarious little tiny tots jumping up and down outside the compound. We had a bit of a compound to keep people from running all over the helicopters when they landed, but little bunch of littlies would be jumping up and down saying, Mr. Ken, Mr. Ken, Mr. Ken. Come That's here, what memories are made of, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was such good stuff. Um, so, uh, yeah, we, uh, after a year and a half of work, we all got the boot. There was a change of, of politics and out, out we went in another so-called election, which the military ignored. Um, so then you did... Ended up doing three years in Laos with Marg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Burma thing was over, we, and um, uh, and then since the company had aircraft in Asia, which they stored in Singapore, um, they linked up, bought out actually a um, a company that worked on the west coast of Australia um, called um, West Coast Helicopters who were having um, problems. And West Coast Helicopters had just established a foothold 
in Lyle, and um, we're, we're looking at basing it in aircraft over there. And so I got involved through helicopters in New Zealand into their Lao operation, which became one of their own. Then they called themselves Lao West Coast Helicopters. And um, I went over, it was under, in Australian hands, and I went over as the first New Zealander. I went over expecting to fly just as a pilot, but they made me manager and senior pilot as well. And then we ran that operation for oh, two and a half years. I went because I, I'd done seven weeks there. Was it seven weeks? I think there's a bit of a trial for the Australians and then where it went back as manager, senior pilot to run the thing when HNZ bought it properly out. And uh, the reason I went, well, one, I loved Asia that I'd seen in Burma. And secondly, is that it was the first occasion I, we could take that we could share an adventure with Marg. Yeah. We, we'd learnt we couldn't have a family. We said plan B is to tear around, have a bit of fun, do some neat stuff. The lao cropped up almost immediately. We made that decision and off we went as a pair. Um, so we spent about two and a half years in Lao. My goodness. Oh. Some of the... <laughs> it was a love hate. <laughs> there sound like a lot of challenges, but um, maybe can you talk about the people you met there um, and how special they've become to you over the years? I just... I just finished telling you, you know, we all got the boot. Politics changed. It was a f farce of an election held um, in Burma, and they slammed the doors on the place again. Um, and so all the people we'd got to know really um, were left. I'd always promised them I'd take Marg back, but of course that seemed really distant. Um, and the um, military clamped down and ran the place under their iron fist. Until about 2011, and the politics changed just sufficiently to let people in again, and uh, Marg and I went back on a, uh, on a small people tour. But part of the reason for going back was to see if I could link up with some of the villagers who had loved us to death when I worked there 22 years before. And as it happened, we did, through luck and typical Burmese um, resourcefulness, we managed to find the village people uh, through one or two of the characters who had been schoolboys when I was there, but who were now, you know, 35-year-old adults. Um, so in a, in a, cutting a longish story short, um, we promised them we'd go back the next year, and, we, and so we did, and we got the most joyous, joyous reception you could ever believe with um, all these people that we'd known as kids and now they were adults and we knew their uncles and aunties and grandmothers and, and things like that. Gosh, it, it was just gorgeous. We weren't actually allowed to be there, but the villagers had organised it so it looked like we were staying in Mandalay, but in fact we were 150 miles away on the back of someone's motorbike tearing around, um, revisiting people and places that I'd known 20 odd years, 20 odd years before, and we were still the only Europeans the village had ever seen since we left. I mean, how fabulous is that? Yeah, amazing. And it was so good, we went back a few years after that again, and things were even a little bit better as far as the government was concerned. Um, we didn't have to cheat and lie as much or put people in danger when we went back again. So we left, fabulous, and I wrote another book about it um, because it was it was so gorgeous one was my my flying and in, in, um, in Burma and how much you know it opened my eyes to living you know in those eras those times the the people who we just loved to pieces and and they did the same for us and um, and then the story between we managed to keep in touch very fragile, <coughs> excuse me, very fragile links with people. And then the reunion when we went back and enjoyed them again and found out all the things that had happened to them between times. So uh, I also, in going back to the village the second time, um, had to get their 
permission to write about them because if they were frank and they were absolutely frank with us, uh, I didn't want to put them in danger with their military rulers. Even mm. even then, it was it was too risky. So we yeah we did that, and just as the book was about to be um, published, uh, the military coup that happened two years ago happened, and of course everything has changed. My book no longer even fits. My book was gentle and funny and um, personal, and. Everything that's happening in Burma or Myanmar, as it's called now, is there's nothing gentle, um, funny, or anything about it. It's virtually a civil war. Army, modern army, military generals, military regime against people that have had a, enough of a uh, glimpse of democracy and sharing and freedom, and it's just been closed off again. So that's the conflict. It's still ongoing. We've lost some friends, four friends at least, through being killed. Um, we've lost friends who've had their houses burnt down by the regime. And Must be got, so hard uh, to sit back here knowing how um, you know nice and amazing the people are, having interacted with them and being helpless. Friends in hiding helped us. We set, set up a little trust. We are putting a girl through university and we were helping the village with very modest means that we have at our disposal for health and welfare and schooling and, and things. Um, and the book, of course, that was to help fund that. Well, everything's slammed shut now. Lots of our friends who are all pro-democracy have seen as threats to the re regime have been forced into hiding. So that's sort of where we're at now. And um, the joy that Burma was r remains, but the anxiety and the exasperation and the anguish that they're living with now every day haunts us and we see um you know villages that we loved you know that have just been torched by the regime and re reduced to ruins and things and all the folk that jumped up and down and called out mr ken mr ken we love you uh, uh, you know uh, how are they now it was so it was so tough really tough but they'll see it out. They're so um, yeah. resourceful and absolutely so determined. But there's some awful, bloody, truly bloody, and it's in, in that sense stuff still to happen. Yeah. And um, yeah, no, we're lost for words. Just to close off your flying career. Yes. In May 2000, you got some. Not good news. Uh, medical. Yep. Oh, yeah. So you had a medical event and ended up losing your medical. Yep. Yep. Mm. Yep. Yep. And I had an, an inner ear problem. Um, it suddenly le leapt out of the blue. Um, so that was the end of aviation, really, for me. And How did that? Did you feel like, um, you know, most pilots, when they lose their medical, it's the worst thing that can happen. They've lost their career. But I, I don't know, I'm, I'm picking that you've had a lot of other things in your life. Was it the worst thing that could have happened for you? It wasn't the worst thing at all. Um, it, it was a blow, of course, because aviation, the, the, the time I'd have had with aviation, privileged visiting to amazing places with great people and, and all that stuff, it was so special. I feel really grateful for that. Um, the things that doesn't do though if you're if, if you're a pilot in those sorts of situations that I was in um, it robs you of anything else any other interest anything it's so all-consuming so when this thing happened you know you look at at the life you've had and the life you've just lost well a bit of sad because any, any time you lose something that's really precious it, it's sad but the other end of it is that all the things that Maggie and I couldn't do before because of aviation now opened, you know, a way to do it. So we looked at at that as a great positive opportunity. Right. Yeah, let's mm. let's tear into some hobbies, do some overseas travel. We're older and wiser, and we still um, love each other to bits. So we've got the, all sorts of things that 
that we'd longed to do but never had time for because it, it was robbed by the aviation. So, um, bloody aviation, <laughs> bloody aviation. Yeah, the good, the goods and the bads. Yeah. So no, well, once we we very quickly got our head around that mm. and um, sealed it into the um, long. I'd already, I was fifty five already, and I'd done twenty years in the helicopter, and I'd been lucky to go to some neat places and do some neat jobs and when it was all over you think well you know i'm so glad i did it now what now what what should we do now yeah. right <laughs> <laughs> this is becoming a marathon in a good way <laughs> it's a bit like research I, I, I'll, I'll try and keep a wee bit brief no not at all succinct. so we've just had um, some lunch to give us some more stamina um, for the moose story. But during lunch, um, a good friend of both of ours, Matt McGorn, has just um, sent a text because he found out I was interviewing, interviewing you. And he said, make sure Ken talks about his ag pilot story. <laughs> so we've just heard it um, over lunch, but you, you said you do have some ag time, 11 seconds of it. <laughs> And it's a good story, so maybe you just want to quickly relate it, if you okay. wouldn't mind. No, not not at all. We, <clears throat> Mark and I had a 10-acre block in Wanaka, and we had one and a quarter acres in the asparagus. Now, it just so happened one of the worldwide pilots, who was a, a real egg pilot, uh, dropped off his seed-spreading bucket for us to keep uh, an eye on while he's working a couple of weeks um, away and was intending to pick it up. And so I had a look at this thing, and I had a look at my asparagus, and I figured that um, a little bit of fertiliser on the asparagus would be a really great idea. So I set the um, um, <clears throat> the spreader up and started its little engine, and I um, we poured, I don't know, half a dozen or eight bags of fertiliser into this thing. And... Um, cranked up the Jet Ranger and parked alongside and uh, plugged everything in and then um, carefully lifted off um, and oops, all the un electrics came undone. So I landed again and got a bit of extra cord and <clears throat> plugged the thing back in and uh, lifted off again ever so gently. I guess I was a little bit flustered by this stage. Um, anyway, I took the uh, bucket over the hill, lined it up on the asparagus, started my first run, uh, pushed the button to uh, work the pneumatics to open the uh, uh, open the base, and um, unfortunately it, it was the uh, hook button, and the whole thing collapsed into the ground, <laughs> bent and um, buckled and uh, half buried, and I turned the helicopter around, hopped back over the fence, parked it, pulled the electrics off, shut the thing down. Tied the blades down, went and had a nice cup of tea. <laughs> so um, when I got asked <laughs> by Craig how much ag time I had, I was able to say quite honestly, um, to be fair, Craig, not a lot. Um, he's a one hour twenty five sec, uh, one minute twenty five seconds, if you take the time that I uh, hooked the thing up for the first time and landed, or from the time I pushed the button to the time I returned to base, probably mm, 11 seconds. Um, <laughs> nothing to story. skite about. But um, but it's good to have on your CV. Uh, yeah, people say, uh, have you got much ag time? And I can honestly say, oh, well, I've done some, but not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks, Matt, for pointing this out. <laughs> yeah, little rat bag, Matt. <laughs> right, um, let's talk about moose. Um, it's a story that, captivates a lot of people for whatever reason in New Zealand and probably overseas. Um, it's been compared to Bigfoot and the the legendary Black Panther in Canterbury and the lack of an actual photo or an animal has probably only served to um, make the legend grow over the years. But for you and Marg, it's clearly not a legend. It's... it's um, it's a fact, I guess that's one way to put it. How does it make you feel, and is it frustrating when these comparisons to Bigfoot and Black Panthers are made, when to you guys it's a lot more than that? 
it, it doesn't frustrate me, but the comparisons are so uh, are so wrong. Um, it's a little bit like uh, how, how do you say? Um, for Moose, we know that they were released in 1910. We know they survived uh, up until 19, the early 1950s, 1952, where we have got records of live animals and dead ones, um, you know, to, to look at. Um, so when we're talking moose, all we're talking about is whether the animals uh, or the progeny has survived into the, uh, the present decades. Um, with Bigfoot, with... Uh, <laughs> We, we don't know really. Yeah. I'm surprised with, with all the activity that went on with with Bigfoot or Sas, Sasquatch. You know, they haven't turned to DNA more because they've seemed to have had lots of opportunity and where did the thing live and where did it bed and take it a little bit more detail. So, um, you know, it doesn't fit with me. Um, all the other things that they compare it with is uh, Yeti and Moas and... Um, all sorts of things. None of them quite fit, but you just, you know, we just shrug and look at our world and the things that we've learned. And um, I'm totally happy with with where we're at, mm. uh, with it and our interpretation of what we see. So, uh, yeah, we uh, kind of get on with it, really. Yeah. You've both spent a, a pretty good percentage of your lives living in Fiordland in, in packets. Um, looking, searching for moose. You've been called the godfather of moose in New Zealand <laughs> and various other names, good and bad. Um, and you've written extensively about it in two books. I wonder, as an introduction to this section of your life, would you mind just reading out uh, what's on the back of your book, The Wild Moose Chase? Uh, yeah, I can, <clears throat> I can do that. I know I've been linked... Um, with it and called a moose man and all sorts of things but in fact this is a story really about moose and, and not about me uh, the way I look at it is um, it, it's such an intriguing story and it's a New Zealand story not a me story and if I'm leading the charge at the moment you know so be it but but the, um, the moose is the hero here, um, is the way I see it. Anyway, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll do what you ask. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote this about 1995, I think. Fjordland in midwinter. Soaked to the skin, despite my parker, I was becoming very cold. Sometimes I wondered what I was doing here. In the gathering dusk, I hunted quietly, pushing gently through dripping pepperwood. Inside the edge of the swampy clearing, then stopped again, alert, watchful. Still no sign of life. The sky was leaden. A week's rain had stopped only hours before. Dark, forested slopes crowding the small valley disappeared into low cloud. It was nearly dark. I shivered involuntary, time to give up for another day. A final look around, a shrug to myself. Careless of noise now, I crossed the creek, knee-deep and icy, and headed home, following the side stream along the clearing's edge to avoid the deep swamp. Some deer had used the path recently, their tracks were clear in the wet sand. Then I noticed another set of tracks, quite different, crisp and clear in the mud, big splayed footprints, large slotted dewclaw imprints, dewclaw imprints. Rain and cold were forgotten, my heart hammered, moose footprints, moose, a New Zealand moose had walked here only a few hours before. Beautiful, thank you. <laughs> and and I, to me, it that encapsulates so much of what this story is about. It's about Fiordland, about long fruitless searches, about the excitement of the um, sign that you have found. Um, do you want to maybe 
speak briefly about what sparked your interest in moose and this lifelong search for them? I was interested in moose actually from a, a really early age because that's what things excited me in those days of mountains and um, wild animals just from, you know, as a 14-year-old when I started tramping in the Kawekas and the, and the Northern Rohinis with our local tramping club. And it got, I, I guess, um, it, I was born in 1945. When you're talking th those years, it wasn't too far ahead of when the 1952 um, shootings and um, images took place in the Auckland Weekly News and things. And so it was a thing a little kid keen on the mountains and bush and animals, you know, would learn about. So it set itself along a long uh, way back. And then in the summer of 1966-67, I did a season shooting in um, Wapiti and Red Deer, especially in the uh, field down area. So I was pretty familiar. And we, a lot of it um, was, you know, the Grebe, the Florence, the Jackery, the Fowler, and Lake Row um, areas, which look right down onto the Seaforth. And my mate and I, frequently said well what about the moose down there you know the shadowy seaforth way below and we'd intended to go there but in fact um the conditions of the, of the time didn't we didn't have enough time ran out of food it got snowed upon and so on and so on so, on. so i always left there saying one day i'm going to go and have a look for those moose and you know and i did mm. <laughs> did i ever um um, I was going to say, so, um, <clears throat> um, so then I was into animal research from 1979 to, um, I beg your pardon, 1969 as a, as a scientist, 1969 to 1979. And one of the first big jobs we did was a great big, um, um, ecological survey in Seward, field down the Wapiti area, plus a bit on, on the top and plus a bit to the bottom. And I ran the animal side of that. Um, so we went very far away. And in collecting the history of the Wapiti and Red Deer uh, in um, the northern field land, you know, historically, moose and Wapiti were always connected by the early hunting uh, organisations and administration. So I, along with my Wapiti Red Deer file, I had a slowly building moose file. Um, Hands on for me came in 1972 because in 1971, April 1971, a uh, Te Anau meat hunter called Gordon Anderson, who was working on the western side of, of Fiordland, was overheard on a radio to have said, Shot a moose. He didn't actually say moose, he said, Shot a M O O S E. <laughs> Um, which was picked up by people and a rumour spread around quickly that, that Gordon had shot a moose. Well, when, <laughs> I was there when Gordon flew out on the float plane and he stormed past the waiting crowd without saying anything and disappeared and um, was barely heard of <laughs> again for weeks. Um, anyway, the rumour spread that a moose had been shot in Fiordland and was such public interest in it that um, <clears throat> the park board asked the forest service to do a survey and the forest service didn't want to be drawn into anything too sticky, asked the Forest Research Institute, of which I was a part, to undertake a survey. Now, um, a Southland um, News reporter managed to coax one sentence out of Gordon um, about the moose and he said he had seen a bull moose and a cow moose in uh, uh, infield, and that was it. He clammed up and never said anything about it <laughs> for maybe the rest of his life. I don't know. He certainly was no help for us um, because we went and asked um, uh, about it, and he said, "You can go and find out for your bloody selves." <laughs> Um, so thank you, Gordon. That was about as much help as I ever got. But you took his advice. Anyway, we took his advice and we did. So in, um, in February 1972, as the leader of a small group of 
uh, four of us, we went into field land to see if there was any substance in the rumour that uh, Gordon's uh, observation had, had started. Um, where do you start on a thing like that? Well, you look up with what records are, are available and what, what's been published and, you know, the, the sightings and shootings and things to that, to that time had clustered in the Seaforth, Dusky Sound, Wet Jacket Arm area. So we made that centre of our search um, and put a few food drops and built a few couple of tent camps. Um, <laughs> where to start? It took, uh, we, we were in Fjordland for 11 weeks. It wasn't till the ninth week we found something that we were really sure of. Um, having said that, um, uh, there wasn't without a lot of debate about sign that we'd seen and were unwilling to interpret um, as being moose for sure. I suppose um, at this time you didn't have the experience you have now. Yeah, to we were well sure. up on Red Deer, well up in Fjordland. We were young and fit and keen, and um, the rain just bounced off us in those days, and we weren't too worried about <laughs> discomfort on that. And try as we could, we could not. We had a, f a few really um, fierce debates about sign that we were seeing, and so I say the ninth week, nine out of eleven, not far to go. Um, when two of us on an overland trip between Supper Cove and Dusky and, and Herrick Creek and Wet Jacket, um, um, we struck fresh, so weak old sign, weak old sign, which no matter where you looked at it, it had to be a moose. It could be absolutely nothing else, not just by default, but because all the other little signs that browsing shows up. And, and continuing our journey into wet jacket arm, um, this kind of a day's trip, and in, entirely along that whole route, we were striking where that animal, which was obviously heading in the same place as we were, but had do, done, you know, a week and gradually less before, uh, we kept st striking sign again, sign again, more sign, more sign, and by the time we got to um, the lower end of of Herrick, um, we we were in the area. We knew that an animal which hadn't been there previously, because we'd searched the, the place, had suddenly appeared, and what's more, was living very close to us. So from the next day on, by well, this time there were four of us back in Herrick Creek. <clears throat> we did merry circles round each other for the next week. I do not know how we missed that animal. But the important thing was, um, with every step, with every day, um, with every excursion, and with every frustrated attempt to see the blasted thing, uh, we were learning more and more and more about what sign looked like, what species it was eating, uh, how it fed, where it sat down, where it stood up, where it walked in the footprints we'd left the day before, and and so on. So suddenly, suddenly we had something to talk about. Mm. And suddenly all the sign that we were unwilling to accept before because it didn't look exactly right, we could reinterpret in the fresh view of what we had just seen. So, okay, you know, by the 10th <laughs> week, we had at last something to say. Um, uh, then, right in the middle of that of that time, we also picked up a cast antler, a cast antler on the on the uh, northern side of Wet Jacket Arm, about halfway up, uh, on the edge of a forest forest beach interface, a cast antler. Now, there's a lot of information in a cast antler. Um, it tells you that a living animal, and in this case, a male at two and a half years of age, had dropped his antler, um, which is a bit of skeletal material, absolutely can't be confused with red deer at all. And um, 
as a three, two or three year old, he could be expected to live well into the 1980s. So the importance of that was, hang on a sec, who's talking 1952 anymore? We found um, sign which we judged absolutely positively to ourselves was moose, but we also had a bit of skeletal evidence which showed um, animals were still present, um, a young animal, and one that would, you know, have another eight or <laughs> seven or eight or ten years still to live. So we're talking 1980 now, not you know, not 1952 anymore. So we went back um, armed with that um, information. Um, there were red deer, not huge numbers through the area, but those that were there were living on the um, productive parts of that forest. That is, and the, the things that they could, could feed on were um, valley bottom clearings, which were, you know, eaten to the point of being like a billiard table, um, slips, and of course the uh, tussock tops. Well, none of these things moose can use at all, but the few deer that were, that were there were um, clustered in, in, those, um, in those types of vegetation. And as well in what we call the cereal forest, which is the um, the the, the um, early succession forest that grows uh, on slips and clearing edges and um, tree fall and other things. And that's your your fuchsias and your mahoe and your wineberry and your ribbon wood and your pate and your um, lance wood and five finger soft species like that so of all the forest the um the only bird available to moose really of interest because they are grazers they are browsers only and not grazers browsers only and not grazers the only bit of forest that was of any use to a moose in a depleted forest situation was the cereal forest and you know that country is so steep and it slips all the time so there's actually moderate amounts of cereal forest around but they was t they were shared by the deer as well so when i came out my conclusion uh, was in the report that i was obliged to write said yes there are moose here no there's hardly any um <laughs> they are being out competed by red deer in the forest type that's important to them. I th my belief is unless something extraordinary happens, um, moose are going to slip into extinction, and it's because you know they they can't hack the um, competition from red deer. Red most of us have evolved to be a very specialist animal, and this that specialization uh, do, doesn't work if it's in competition with a generalist like red deer. Red deer can graze, they can browse. Moose can only browse. Um, red de moose have got a a little sh you know long in the leg, high in the shoulder. Um, big long muzzle, uh, excellent swimmers. Some of those things are pluses for the moose and some of them are minuses. Um, for example, like unable to graze and unable to take advantage of the small plants that are in a, in a forest or the sort of a micro, um, you know, revegetation, the um, tiny, tiny plants that grow that red deer can just vacuum up as they walk around. And moose, of course, can't eat off the ground without the front legs being splayed or even kneeling. Um, moose can't take advantage of the grasses, so the tops and the clearings and the um, slips um, aren't any use to them. So what are the advantages moose had were a reach, red deer limits of its reach, 2.1 metres, 
um, moose 2.7 meters. There's one small band of vegetation which moose can use, which red deer can't, uh, can't, but there's not a heck of a lot of around. And once it's ripped down, of course, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, that's the reason that made me say, unless something extraordinary happens, moose are going to go down the tubes. But isn't it amazing they've lasted this long? Anyway. Um, just to maybe go back a, a step or two, um, and, and again, just very briefly cover the introduction of moose into New Zealand, oh, for those okay. that aren't aware of it. So right. 1910, Okay, we're it? talking 1910. Mm. Okay. So there was 10. 10 young moose introduced in 1910 and released in from the, from where from Sask uh, caught as calves in Saskatchewan and Alberta, transferred to Vancouver, transferred again via Australia to um, um, Symes Island in Wellington Harbour, um, quarantined there for a while, picked up again on the government steamship Hinamoa, dropped off in Supper Cove, Dusky Sound in April 2000, uh, April 1910, okay, six young animals, four, uh, four males, six females, Did I say, uh, ten young animals, ten young animals, four males, six females. Now, we know when we're looking at um, releases of um, similar ungulates on New Zealand, game animals in New Zealand, it, if there's less than four females, the release fails, always. If there's more than four females, it invariably is a success. So, um, so Moose started off with six, but a, a week after they were released, one was shot by a fisherman and one of the females. And um, on release, um, two of the moose squabbled and one broke a, a front uh, leg. And if that's the animal that Eddie Herrick shot in 1930, which was um, cut open, it shot out of compassion, a three-legged moose in old, very old and in poor condition, and cut open to reveal it had never um, uh, carved. It meant that the moose started off quite badly with a four plus four. In contrast, red deer were, had uh, at least four releases from Manapuri. At least two of them had more than 10 animals in these mixed age hinds. Of course, meant they could get stuck into breeding right away successfully. And red deer, in an environment which is super abundant in food, can double their numbers every third to fourth year. So red deer were... Uh, you know, strikingly expensive in their um, after liberation in that area, and they flooded over the passes. And by the mid twenties, mid nineteen twenties, red deer were really abundant in in the seaforth and the areas we were looking. So that's a sort of a little bit of background. Most of us are struggling for survival, um, probably. I mean, here's the other really important thing, and I should have said this earlier, probably. Um, the animal, the moose that were liberated were all juveniles. Um, moose, by nature, are a solitary animal and not a social animal. So the inclination isn't to um, be together. Somehow, we had to wait till those um, <laughs> now eight animals reached sexual, sexual maturity enough to even have a chance of surviving so and then find each other and then find each other mm. and the males which normally wouldn't have socially been given if any opportunity to breed um you know had to breed as a, as two and a half year olds um to have their first calf at, at three so uh shaky start for the moose and a rocket start for red deer just over the hill and in the end, the, it's the red deer moose interaction, which is, you know, so important. There's, n there's nothing else really matters uh, significantly in in that equation. Is um, 
red deer are going to do really well in overwhelming numbers and uh, eat everything in the forest up, up to 2.1 meters. And the moose, the ones that can hang on, are going to uh, only have a short, although they can eat and digest more woody material and have got a slightly higher reach, 60 centimetre higher reach, they're the advantages the moose had and no, the other advantages the red deer have will cert certainly overwhelm them. I don't articulate that very well, but I'm sure you can see they're just yeah, yeah. two unfair partners. Yeah, sure. um, anyway, that, that was um, my play on things and that's what I, that's what I said on the report when we got out. So between that period and 1952, when the last known moose was oh, shot, okay. there was yeah. quite a few <clears throat> shot in the 30s. Um, yeah, go back to the start again. Um, 1910, release of 10 animals reduced to um, 8. 1924, beginning of licensed hunting, very restricted. 1929, Eddie Herrick, Hawke's Bay sportsman, shoots the first trophy moose in the Seaforth Valley. 1934, Eddie Herrick, same fellow, shot his second trophy moose, Herrick Creek. 1934, same area, all protection released from um, um, imported game animals. Um, and suddenly information dries up. Mid-1930s, moose thought to be extinct. Um, 1951, out of the blue, um, Robin Francis Smith shoots a female moose in the um, Henry Byrne, and his, his party found um, cast antlers and other evidence of moose. A year later, 1952, um, Jim McIntosh, uh, a Climatization Society ranger, shoots a female moose here at Creek. 1952, um, slightly later, um, Percy Lies shoots a trophy bull moose here at Creek, and his companion and himself take photographs of live animals. 1952. The last known photo. The last photo photographs that we know of that were taken of moose alive and dead and the lack of information between that time and Gordon Anderson's um, supposed sighting um, the animals were thought to have become extinct again so our trip really 1972 established no, that they, they were still there in small numbers hanging on by a thread very fragile, fragile likely to um, to slip into extinction. Um, actually, what my report said didn't matter much at all because we hadn't seen one and hadn't got a photograph. Most people were inclined to believe that, uh, disbelieve that, that that our interpretation that moose still existed. I don't know what they thought about the cast <laughs> Um which is a, a familiar story throughout the the moose story, which we can have a talk about yeah. that later because uh, it's an interesting yeah, it is, isn't discussion it? about human nature. About human, but uh, since the 1972 mission, um, and really in the 90s and the 2000s, you've uh, sort of we're getting to that. Okay, sorry, I'm jumping ahead. <laughs> no, no. I'll leave you tell no, the story. No, no, um, because people poured so much um, disbelief and scorn on our. 72 conclusion, I started to have doubts about my own interpretation of it as well. Right. So I went back on a private trip for five weeks in 1974-75 summer just to make sure that but, uh, um, what I was talking about was accurate. And the impression I came away, again, um, having seen si sign of moose, and good sign of moose in um, several places, was exactly... But I was happy with that my impressions were correct, and, and even okay. that the interpretation of likely um, demise was, you know, was right. But as I'd said, um, unless something extraordinary happens, I don't believe moose are going to last in Fjordland much longer. Um, 
something extraordinary did happen, and that was the venison industry um, coming in and playing such a huge part in, in reduction of red deer right through field land. Just huge. You wouldn't think that a handful of helicopters or up to 25 perhaps could make a difference in an area which is largely forested. But it made a difference because the forest was in such a depleted condition from overpopulation of red deer, and red deer were obliged in order to live or make a living at all to use the forest clearings, the slips, the cereal forest, and the open tops, all which can be hunted quite easily by helicopter. And the forest itself held so little food it had very little interest for the red deer. So red deer, in order to make a living, were concentrated in places where the helicopters could hunt. And 25 fuse, um 300s and, um, you know, a dozen uh, fuse 500s, Catching deer at twenty five hundred dollars a pop um, put such immense pressure that deer populations were reduced to just a fraction, perhaps by ninety percent, um, in the entire fieldland. In fact, it, it takes place all over New Zealand as well. So suddenly, um, an overcrowded, depleted forest had an opportunity to do <laughs> do something, and and do something it did. Um, between 1985, <clears throat> when the venison industry largely folded up there, and 1990, when Maggie and I went back, um, the forest had sprung back to life in such a surprising way that literally around uh, old slips, around the coast, and around clearings, it, you had to force your way through um, thickets of regeneration. It was almost as if the forest had reverted to... Was it a shock to you, the amount of regeneration? It was a shock to see how quickly it had regenerated and how completely, and things like a what had been a, a slip, you know, bare as a bowling green, was now kind of 10 to 12 feet um, of wineberry and um, fuchsia and, and so on. So just amazing, just amazing. So one small step back, Marg and I, uh, with all my overseas flying, you know, we were kind of looking for a few decent adventures together, and we went back to Wet Jacket Arm for five weeks, bought a, with a little inflatable, just to relive some of those f f amazing old days that I'd had, you know, 20 years before. So when the helicopter flew off and left us on the Herrick Creek beach in the dead silence with our big pile of gear, and we walked up to go to our old campsite from 1972. Uh, two things struck me. One is just how completely the forest had, the understory of the forest had recovered. Just how completely was, as I said, it was, you had to force your way through it. Incredible. Stands of pate, fuchsia, everything you could think of packed. And the second impression was right where we camped was that a moose had been there a few months before with its characteristic feeding sign everywhere you looked. So, one, the forest had changed, and two, in spite of my prediction of them slipping into extinction, they'd been given a reprieve. Um, the forest had sprung back. Um, the cavalry that came over the hill was the venison boys and then and the, and the live capture era, which reduced deer just a, a fraction of what they had been. So um, the next five weeks that uh, Margie and I spent um, tearing around just revealed just here and there, mm. here again, um, sign of moose. And uh, it, it seems, you know, look back at it now that a population right on the edge of extinction, given a reprieve, um, had make a, made a minor comeback. And the red deer, of course, on the other hand, were well poised to do exactly the same thing. So um, the resolution we made then, after that trip, was let's make a project out of this 
um, we had enjoyed it. She, Mark talked to a field and I was going to say like water off a duck's back, but just not a very good, very good <laughs> com comparison. Um, we just loved it. We just absolutely loved it. We loved the landscape and the seascape and the birds and the history and the, um, but the, the driving force was moose. Let's, I, the task I set myself then was to um, um, bury myself in this project. Both of us give it heaps, enjoy the outdoors, um, face the challenges, and challenges they were of, um, you know, living there f f for long periods, getting a handle of what's happened to the moose, um, simply uh, um, mental challenges living in Fjordland, physical challenges because the places you can be quite unkind. I loved that her academic challenge of um, uh, working out exactly what's happened, and I wanted to put it put it down into a credible narrative of um, you know beginning to end, upside down, inside out. Um, back to front, everything I could learn about moose history, ecology, what's happening, blah, blah, blah. And um, that started off actually a 25-year period where we went in and out of field land time and time again. Most of the trips were never less than a month and, um, and lived it and loved it, absolutely loved it. How much and, time do you think you've spent living in Fjordland in your life? Mark and I, as a couple, have done at least two years if you add them all up, and then we did another year if you add some of the um, if, if you add the ten year period we did trips as guides on the Milford Wanderer, a, a, um, a boat um, doing what they call their discovery trips down the um, down the Western Sounds. Um, then if you count other trips, uh, yeah, years, five, three, four, three, three and a half years probably if you tacked it all up together. I, I did a few month long solos as well. So we we were nicely hands on, is what I wanted to say. We were nicely hands on and some trips we learnt very little and other trips we hit it and, and learned a a heap and every little bit of information added something to the picture and made it um, made us a little bit more authorit authoritative about what we were seeing. Uh, one remarkable, it took us decades to learn this, but the remarkable thing is that we learnt was that moose um, are not resident in, in, in any, any area. They do a big seasonal beat right around a huge block. How long is, I don't know how long, how big a block they, they do that for. Um, so if you find sign as we did in Herrick Creek, um, uh, Lower Herrick Creek, end of July, good sign everywhere. Been a moose here. Oh, it's been here a few days. Look at the mess it's made. Um, uh, don't expect to come back next month and find the sign there. It's it's not. But if you come back exactly the same time, then next year you're going to find exactly the same. And it was so clear. One one animal used the lower reaches of Herrick Creek every year, probably for about a week at a time, um, for seven years. It's incredible. And that's when we started to set up um, camera arrays to see if we could get a crack. Because what what we had learnt is that other people expect to, would not accept moose presence unless they had a photograph or at least a sighting. And I don't know what they expected in Fjordan. You don't get these rare animals coming out of the fernery and, and surrendering. You know, <laughs> it's just um, we were we were getting. Most information we needed from the characteristic browsing sign. We didn't take too much notice of pellets or of footprints unless they were combined with that. But there's a lot of information in browsing sign, and that told us things like uh, presence, how long it 
might have been there, what it was eating, and you can read that stuff back for several years. So if you walk into a if you walk into an area cold, um, the first thing you do is go to the nearest bit of cereal forest, you know, old slip sites, um, and the signature species there, which tell us if a moose has been there, and if it's over 2.1 metres, it most certainly is a moose. Um, not just from the height, which is out of reach for red deer, but with the style of feeding that the moose do. Grasp, break, strip, not no, 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 like a red Because they don't have a top row of teeth. Yeah, is it it's a bit, no, it, it's a little bit like a um, uh, prehensile lip for, that horses have, for example, um, and a, a, a palate, not a um, not a row of teeth, not like a horse at all. But you can see that, you know, their own specialty, the most of specialised animals, um, and that's one of the specialties they've developed. And, and it, kind of works for them some ways and not in others. So, so if you had to um, put a case together for a judge who's going to decide the validity of the findings that yep. you've found over 20 or 30 <clears throat> years, yep. what would be the key evidence you would put to that judge that you've oh, found? Um, DNA. And maybe the specific uh, yeah. times you found it. Oh, yeah. Now, DNA is the best tool that we have for this. Uh, but we've only got two records, 2001 and 2002, which means those animals of the midlife might live another eight or ten years. Um, but, uh, and that, that was hair records? Oh, and the, these were done, uh, these were found on snagged hair yep. on, on a browsing site. Yeah. Um, it was very hard to work with. DNA in those days, and it's much easier now, but finding sign now is a lot harder than it was in the 1990s when Marg and I started, um, our, um, you know, getting on in, uh, in real serious stuff. Um, because of be the reduction in animals Yeah, because I, I think the deer, the moose that benefited from the flush of vegetation that followed the venison boys' activities have now lived their lives out, and we're back to the same scenario. And the critical part is this, really. Um, moose have got a few advantages of, of red deer in, the, in their reach, and that they can eat woody material and digest woody material. Um, um, so if an animal lived to be an adult, I think it could make a precarious living. But the guts... Of, of the problem for moose is that a calf, a moose calf, is the same size as a red deer. It can't have the reach of an adult, and neither can it graze or or eat the tiny bits of mycorrhizae that happens under a forest anyway. So, it would be very unlikely to reach adulthood. Right. In the present situation, which is a replay of what it was in the 70s, a flush of vegetation after the venison boys pulled out. Um, ten years later, uh, high populations of red deer. Ten years later, populations peaked. Animals in poor condition, um, living their lives out. Poor recruitment for red deer calves as well. Population crashes. Um, Moose, even more disadvantaged, kind of thing. If you see yeah, what I mean, yeah, yeah. I didn't express that very well. Yeah, but no, I, I understand. Think you can get the gist. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, so there's DNA. What about oh, sightings? Okay. Have there been many oh, sightings? Okay. Yeah, DNA is the best tool we've got, but it, it's underused because we can't find the material right now. The most exciting thing that's happened in recent years is a sighting by helicopter pilot Ben Young on in. 2020 um, and the story is this really Ben had recently got his helicopter pilot's license he was being mentored by the Southern Lakes helicopter boys um, like you know we've got a spare set come along and we'll show you what we do how we do this and does some ferry flying and that as well 
to give him a few hours. Um, he was in the back seat of a R44 doing a southern, uh, a, a, a doubtful sound scenic, and um, they'd done a, a landing in a nice spot on the way home and, and changing weather. Um, he's scanning for deer, as we all kind of do in that situation, and they overflew a moose in a tiny clearing about the size of this room um, on the way home. And he said uh, to the pilot, Matt Deeker, he said, oh, I've just seen a moose. And Matt says, oh, 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 oh. no, no. <laughs> you know, they, turned the, they turned the helicopter around, but it had stepped into the bush. Um, now, our house in Tiana was only 150 metres from the helicopter boy's hangar. So, you know, I'd heard the old 44 clatter in. And then uh, 20 minutes later, tap, tap, tap on the door. And here's our um, salmonist, Ben Young and Matt Decker at the door saying, pour yourself a cup of tea and sit down, we've got something to tell you. And Ben said, I've just seen a moose. Oh, when? He said, about three quarters of an hour ago. Wow. I think what I said began with F. <laughs> <laughs> like far out or something like that, yes. um, perhaps. Anyway, um, they related the story. The weather was on the change. Um, they had two Aussies on board on on a scenic that overflown an animal which Ben instantly identified as a moose and I must say he'd done two years as a, a hunting guide in northern British Columbia and early season that company was targeting moose and caribou for their client hunters and later on it went on to sheep and goats and things but but so he knew absolutely what he had seen and he was on the back not even thinking moose just counting the deer. They'd already, they'd already seen nine. It was a day, he said, where the um, animals were out all over the place. But there was some nice little touches too. And one of them was um, we had a fruit bowl, wooden carved Rimu fruit bowl with oranges in it, just where we were all chatting. And Ben says, oh, it was a different colour. And he said, it was... Mm, that colour, he said, pointing at the wooden bowl, and it was a sort of a, a golden brown with mottled with um, charcoaly stuff. And he said, and the red deer were pretty well that colour, pointing to the oranges. Now, in fe late February, of course, red deer have changed from uh, summer coat to winter coat, and with the sun on them, they are truly bright orange, or burnt orange, you would say, probably more accurately. Um, so that I thought, you know, that's that's a nice touch. But he said the other the other nice thing he said is when we flew over it, he said it shook its head, and he said, ah, that big long face, those big floppy ears. So I thought, oh yeah. So yeah. to you, it was a c completely believable sighting. Oh, absolutely. And I say believable sighting because um, in the mid-70s, we'd been doing a camera check. And as as we come home, we do what we call window shopping. And we found in a, an adjacent valley, in the upper reaches of an adjacent valley, sign so remarkably moose-like that Margie and I went back and spent 10 days there almost immediately. And... The, we couldn't find the moose, only where it had been. But how we missed it, I don't know. If we could have done DNA stuff then, we could have made it the saliva off the breakages and wow. things. It was that fresh. Yeah. I, I don't know how we missed that animal. And we went back four years in a row, about the same time, a little bit before, a little bit after, to see if that animal retraced its steps. It did, it, but we missed it both times, and then the sign dropped away. So we spent 40 days camped out, there um, to see if that animal had, you know, been on a seasonal beat as as they do through there, and it was targeting mountain robin, um, uh, you know, for probably a few weeks, and then disappeared on, on its beat again. We never saw that one, but it gave us great confidence um, about what we were seeing and and so on. And uh, you, yeah, another friend, um, Matt Ellis. A few years afterwards, heard a moose cow calling there. He didn't know what it was, 
but it was such an unusual sound and he checked it when he got home exactly the sound of a moose cow calling and it's something like a halfway between a donkey braying and a heifer bawling if you like absolutely unlike anything else you might hear in there and Matt and I uh, the pilot when, when he got back to Tianao, um the pilot was telling the pilots were telling him about our game with the moose and he said I'd like to read meet that guy and they said well he just lives over there so Matt comes marching up our drive and now we've got a really good interaction he's been great um, so that was um, that was Ben's sighting we went back immediately the next day hoping that we might find anything that we could get a DNA record off to back the sighting up um, but of course it was a typical field down clearing where you step off the, the helicopter into um, um, you know, water up to your uh, boot, boot laces. And um, it was a very food poor area, that one, because uh, clearly th there's been nothing, the animal hadn't lingered there. So we take it. The animal was an adult female. It was in transit. It was... Um, um, and, uh, I mean, if it lived its... If it was midlife and lived its life out, it would be alive to about um, 2027. Um, it's an area that we were outside the core area, I would have thought, but nonetheless we were familiar with uh, moose in that area before. Matt Ellis and I this year have been on four times, um, and the sign that we find dates back to 2020, but nothing after that. Um, so... Yeah, um, Ben's sighting um, brought the story back to life, um, which I'm very grateful for. Thank you, Ben. And also grateful for the fact that um, I said I need your um, permission to be able to relate your story. But he said, I actually, I'd prefer to keep it to myself um, he said, I'd prefer to keep it secret. How many people in the history of Moose have said that? Because I don't want, you know, all the flack that you guys have put up with. I said, well, you'll put up with flack, all right, but hang on a sec. The story doesn't move at all unless we can make it public. And sure, you're going to get teased and you're going to get a, a flack and, and perhaps some ridicule, but... Um, and that needs your, I need your permission to make it a public, because if you tell me, you can tell me what you like, and I'll honour any, anything you want me to shut up about, I won't, uh, you know, I won't, I won't say, but it's no use to any of us, unless it's, unless it's a genuine record. And he said, oh, okay, he said, I'll stand by what I saw, you can go for your life. So I'm grateful for Ben for that. So we've got a recent sighting. Can we talk about your uh, documentary that you filmed in 1994 with New Zealand Ge Geographic? Uh, yeah, it was more a uh, natural history unit. Natural history unit, yeah. 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 Um, so quite a big project, one that you kept secret for a long time. Yeah. Um, for reasons which maybe you can tell us, and uh, really... Maybe a frustrating outcome at the end because you got some evidence, albeit blurry. Um, but as we were discussing last night, you know, maybe that ev that blurry evidence was good to keep the keep the yeah. project on going and the legend going. And I don't know. Okay, um, <clears throat> yeah, Mark and I were, were doing our month long epics uh, in Fiordland, trying to get a handle on the moose story, um, but we hadn't told well, we told very very few people because we knew that we'd be scoffed at um however um a helicopter friend um, dropped in and to wet jacket one day at our camp and we showed him some fresh sign and he was so taken with it he had a chat with natural history um people who, who was flying around shortly afterwards and they became interested got in contact with us and we had to then make a decision uh, said they would like to to 
scope it out for a documentary because I thought it was such an extraordinary story. And would we help? Um, at least for a recce. So we agonised that a bit because it kind of felt like our own project. And then, but on the other hand, we thought of they we've got such a good handle on it and such a nice history on it already that if they were going to do something, we'd rather be in the middle of it than not in it at all. Um, and, and so launched a four-year project, really, where um, cameraman Max Quinn um, came in and camped with us for a week out of our months, and we put net together a little bit more of the story and a little bit more of the story. Now, if you're doing a documentary about moose, it's quite nice to have a picture of one. Um, but if I could not see, um, I could not see how that. If if you pulled it off, it would be extraordinary lucky. It was a very difficult thing to plan for, um, and we did our best. And sometimes we struck some really good moose between all of us while they were there, or we found them we could show them. But the chances of getting a photo uh, were practically zero, well, no worse than that. <laughs> so, so uh, we started um, a scheme with uh, trail cameras. We thought if we can get a trail camera photograph, and the trail cameras in those days were really uh, clumsy things, like powered by f f five car batteries, a monstrous bit of kit, covered with layers of tarp holes, of course, because of the raid, and they only gave you five weeks. Um, the problem with trail cameras in those days is if you had a camera on standby to get an instant photograph of something appeared, you used up all your battery power. And they, you know, they've, that, that was old time. And things change really quickly. Now you can get trail cameras the size of your fist, which can take 35,000 photographs in a year of operation. In those days, when there were a few meters around, we couldn't. Um, amazingly, though, uh, in the very early stages, we did get one. And although not all people are convinced, if you look at that photograph, you'll see every sign of a moose characteristic and none of a red deer. You know, um, shape, size, stance, color, everything. Uh, interestingly, this, the same camera took a um, photograph of red deer 30 minutes before, and here you have a group, not a solitary one, um, chestnut coloured, lightly built, head upright, not forward and down, you know, typical red deer, typical moose. Most people were pretty reluctant to accept that first off, but I find now that um, those that are still interested looking at it will concede, well, it can't be. It's got to be a red deer or a moose. It's certainly not a red deer. So, um, but it took a long time for that to sink in. Uh, when the documentary came out, we kind of expected it to be. Um, like, I'll say it the other way around. There was so much cynicism about it, and you know, disbelief and teasing. And some of that was great fun, but some of it was uh, a fairly pointed. And I c kind of felt a little bit put out. I suppose I was put out in 1972 too when I wrote that report. It wasn't accepted by by many. But Why is it but that people go. don't want to believe it? I'm surprised. And actually, the hunting community, who I thought would be the ones to embrace it most of all, um, were the most critical, and I guess hunting is a funny game because everyone thinks they uh, you know, the expert, and if it doesn't, this is certainly an extraordinary circumstance as having moose here now, but um, because you, to me, the story is very believable. You've got a scientific background. You're well proven in documenting evidence in, in your books and other stories. Um, you don't really have an agenda with it. You know, why would you be lying about it all? Yeah. And you've documented all the sign and browse mm. sign. Um, yeah. It seems strange it, it, that people it, just it, don't want to believe it. People, yeah, just can't. It's an un, almost it's such an unlikely story. 
uh, I guess, you know, an animal hanging on by a thread for so long. And yet when you put your microscope on but on the bits of it, it's, it's entirely reasonable, you know, the ebb and flow of populations and, and of forest condition and of interaction between the two animals, one which is clearly better at living than the other uh, in those sorts of situations. It all makes sense. I, uh, I can't understand. I just ask people really to have a look at the evidence before they, um, you know, toss it away for their own beliefs which um, are based not on not on evidence but on um, just a general feeling that doesn't sound right, something yeah, like that. Yeah. What are you, or are you still hunting for them? Do you still have cameras out there? Oh yeah, we haven't got cameras at the moment because I don't like having a camera out that's not targeting a particular individual. And it's been a few years now since we've had an uh, intercepted an animal's seasonal beat enough to put a camera array to try and identify it when it comes back. Um, we're willing to do that if if we can find ourselves with um, in that circumstance. Um, in the meantime, we, we're trying to find a sign that's fresh enough that we can present to um, for DNA analysis to get... The lovely thing about DNA, isn't it, is that it's devoid of any judgment. You know, apart from the integrity of the person that picks up the sample, say it's snagged here. Um, you know, it's a job that's made in a distant laboratory and it's absolutely conclusive and that's it. We want more of them. We've only got two. Well, I want 40 so that we can actually start talking distribution and perhaps separate individuals and all that kind of stuff. But I do believe moose are getting thinner on the ground now and they're going through second time in that area an eruptive fluctuation of red deer which has left the forest severely depleted as it is right now so we're looking now at, at this scenario playing out just as it did in the early 70s when we did our survey and, and it's not favoring the moose no the other thing that's changing is you're not getting any younger. I'm definitely not. And I read a, a few years ago now where you said I'm 72 now and it's a pain <laughs> in the ass being this old. <laughs> it's definitely more of a pain in the ass being five years older than that. Yeah. Um, we, we put the pace of things up, but it's harder. We had, I had a foot injury for a year and a half and then COVID and we'd kind of lost touch with the animals we were trying to photograph on the trail cameras because they'd either carked it or the sign has just disappeared some other way. Um, the other thing talking about DNA is the naysayers will say, well, that DNA came from Canada. Or um, if a photo is found, it's it's either from Canada or um, it's been AI generated. Mm, you know, there's, mm, there's no. proof is not proof anymore, is it? There's no end to how you can be um, dismissed yeah. in this game. It, it actually doesn't bother me because I know exactly what we're, we're doing. I'm absolutely comfortable with where we're at. Um, I'd like to do it a bit better. I'd like to rewrite the history book with all the uh, other um, events, sightings, and um, things that end up with... Ben's sighting, and hopefully, um, you know, I'd love to have 20 DNA records from all sorts, from all over the range, just to, to end up with a touch of authority. But of course, it's field land being field land, it's <laughs> tricky. And I think moose in smaller numbers, perhaps, than ever before. Um, Would it be different if you were to find one, or let's say you had found one 10 years ago and photographed it? What would actually change then would you stop your search maybe oh. would they become protected because now it's proven that they're there um it would change the whole if scenario got, wouldn't yeah, it uh, uh, interestingly if we'd if with natural if with natural history unit camera in 1995 had got a clear shot of a moose um the mystery would be ended. And the whole legend's uh, gone. Uh, uh, well, but you're the, not doing the, the, it for the legend, yeah, are yeah, you? Yeah, I, I, love the, I love the legend. I love the idea of having a mystery out there. It would be dismantled in a second. 
um, if we'd got a shot then or if someone um, gets someone, people willing to accept now. But it doesn't change the remarkable story that Moose, despite all odds and despite an, against a really aggressive competitor, have hung on by a thread for just for so long. Something you said, which was really interesting to me, I'd be totally, this is if you saw one, yep. I would be totally content to just make the most of that moment. If floundering for a camera was going to spoil the chances of watching it, I wouldn't even bother with the camera. I'd just enjoy the moment. Exactly. Has that motivation changed over not the years? One, not, not one little bit. I'd I, love to see one. I sort of imagined yeah. in the early days, yeah. it was all about getting proof. Yeah. I would love to see one, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the story a bit, and I don't ever expect to. Um, but if I did, I'd, I'd be absolutely thrilled. If someone else sees one, I'd be is equally thrilled for them and for the project, same as with, with Ben sighting. Um, it, it doesn't change a thing. My, the, As I said before, the task I set myself is to write a credible narrative of everything we've learned about Moose um, because I think it's a, a fascinating story. I love the idea, though, that Fiordland has a haunting, uh, enduring mystery that actually enhances mm. it rather than diminishes from you know the values that we associate with Fiordland Park mm. and all the all the things that that go with it. You know, people say, "What do you think about when you think about Fiordland?" And I say, oh, the picture in my mind is hanging cloud, falling rain, dripping fern, still water, mystery, intrigue, mm. moose. Mm. Kind of fits in there, Perfectly. doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, time will tell, eh? What happens? Yeah. Oh no, it's still there's still animals there. There's very few uh, on the verge of extinction i predicted that once before and been proved wrong um little things not little things things happen that that can change at, or at least prolong it and one is the 2003 earthquake for example something like 600 slips in fiordland uh, you mm -hmm. know uh, um, geological event big big thump hillsides come falling down um, so for the next 15 years following that earthquake, all the regenerative growth that grows on that debris is a food source um, you know, for the animals in the forest and the birds and the other things because cereal forest is particularly productive in terms of fruit and berry and flower and it benefits everyone even though people hate to see slips in field and it's amazing how quickly they grow back. Mm. So... You know, in some ways, here's a great burst of vegetation right on the middle of their suspected range. Um, and it's going to red deer, benefit red deer too, of course. But, but it, you know, here's something. Because when you're talking moose um, welfare, you're talking of forest food. Um, yeah. And um, that, that's the one uh, vegetation community which really supports them. I have a few last questions for you. Go. <laughs> You've had so many adventures in your life and in completely remote and isolated parts of the world and your closest your closeness to your wife Marg is very evident from your books. And one um little a few words you mentioned when you had the crash landing of the squirrel in Antarctica. You said, Oh hell, tears. Marg, where are you? Oh. <laughs> and I just wondered if, you know, you could maybe just talk briefly about the comfort and solace that Marg has given you over the years, especially when you've been away. Um, just support, uh, gosh, um, always, always back up, mm. always back up in the field, you know, um, not just numbers, you know, a remarkable companion, um, intelligent, um, farm girl, practical, 
um, strong, never complains, um, excellent observer. You know, you, you couldn't ask for um, for someone you'd rather share this stuff with. And I'm so lucky that that she's embraced it in the same way that that I did. Um, because if she hadn't, we certainly would have done it. We would have done something else, maybe. So hats off her, to her for that. Um, she tolerated me being away for long periods with some, a lot of my flying. So when we could actually do things together, like we did in Laos, which was a big adventure, and which we have always done in Fieldland, which has been fabulous, um, that we look on those days there's tough bits in them, but my goodness, what a lot of affection and what great bit of bonding for a couple that, um, you know, just en enjoy one another's uh, company and get on and do things, hopefully, to, ma to make a difference to somebody. Um, it's made a difference to us. It's given us so much joy over the years. Do you have any advice for people or people of any age wanting to give something a go in life but they're just a bit scared to take the plunge take that right hand turn do, do something that you don't that you don't think you can do but challenges you and don't let yourself plateau what we used to say to each other was let's just keep growing mm. um, and the, taking the right hand turn with a little bit of unease um, and a, so a fair bit of discomfort but in the end, reward you the, the most satisfaction. Final question. Are there moose walking around out there in Fiordland as we speak? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. More than you might think, because we don't know much about the distribution. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much, Ken, for talking to me. It's been um, really exciting uh, researching about your life and... Um, quite inspiring talking to you and, and your wife and spending some time with you. So Fantastic, thank you. Craig. Thank you. Thank you for um, listening so very generously. <laughs> it it's easy to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for that.